source of life and cause of death. Water can wash away clues, dilute evidence, and conceal corpses. For investigators, water can be a cunning opponent. For criminals, a most accommodating ally. For the perfect crime, just add water. On the morning of Saturday, October 14, 1995, 70 kilometers east of Vancouver, British Columbia, the peaceful town of Abbotsford is plunged into a nightmare when a fisherman discovers a young woman's mutilated, naked body in the Vedder River. The long hunt begins for the murderer, a man who will terrorize the community for months. He will profoundly affect the people of this town and will capture the attention of the national press, who will dub him the Abbotsford Killer. It's Friday the 13th of October. Misty Cockrell and her friend Tanya Smith are on their way home from a party. But instead, the two 16-year-olds decide to continue their evening and go to another party nearby. On the way, their lives will be changed forever. consciousness a few hours later, the attacker has disappeared. So has her friend Tanya. With great difficulty, she drags herself to the hospital a few blocks away. Rod Gale is the lead investigator for the Abbotsford Police. Duty sergeant gave me a call and told me that there had been a young girl come into the MSA hospital and she was badly beaten and she was telling the nurses there that her friend was still missing. At that point, uh, we called out a couple of teams of detectives and our investigation began. Misty's skull is fractured and she needs immediate surgery. She struggles to talk to the detectives as she drifts in and out of consciousness. Tanya was out by the school is what she was telling us. So we had a group of officers over searching in the area of the school to see if we could find Tanya. There is no trace of Tanya. Did she manage to escape? Or did the assailant take her with him? Police fear the worst. At 8 a.m., a man is salmon fishing in the Vetter River, about 15 kilometers outside of Abbotsford. Suddenly, something floating nearby in the shallow waters attracts his attention. As he gets closer, he discovers the naked, lifeless body of a young woman. I was at the hockey rink with my son and I received a page from my office. And I uh, subsequently called back to my office and got some details. And and then I spoke to uh, the Abbotsford police about an incident they had as well. The Abbotsford police sent a picture of Tanya Smith to Inspector McLeod, who is the lead investigator for the RCMP. He arrives at the Vetter River with Detective Kevin Hackett. When I arrived there, the, the police had cordoned off the uh, area where the body had been recovered, brought ashore, and was covered. Inspector McLeod confirms that the victim is indeed Tanya Smith, the 16-year-old reported missing by her friend Misty. McLeod and Hackett examine the victim. We were concerned about the damage that water could do to forensic evidence, DNA evidence, saliva, washing away some uh, fabric or um, fiber evidence that could be crucial. So an important process is to ensure that the hands are, are bagged with paper bags because in a struggle, they may defend themselves and strike back at an attacker. And if they scratch the attacker, they'll get DNA under the fingernails. 
The body is placed in a um, body bag that protects it from the outside environment in an effort to stop any contamination from outside sources. And then it's transported to the, the morgue where it's uh, locked in a uh, crypt. Detective McLeod searches the area for evidence and makes an interesting discovery. There was another scene located just to the south of uh, where the body was recovered in that it was a, uh, a pathway that went down to the water. And at the entrance to that path, what turned out to be Tanya's clothes had been thrown up in the bushes. And there were some indications on the ground that uh, that's where uh, her body had been placed in the water. The investigators are intrigued by the fact that the murderer has chosen to display the victim's clothing. I think it was clear that he wanted her body to be discovered. So that may be part of that, his criminal mindset was to deposit the body when he knew that he would not be detected with it, but it would be found uh, the following day when the river would be filled with fishermen. There were some tire impressions found, and there were some drag marks, what appeared to be drag marks on the ground. Still in hospital, Misty is fighting for her life, but the police are anxious for her recollection of the attack. She's seen her assailant, and she knows where the attack took place. We sent a detective there with a tape recorder, and the instruction was tape record everything she said. She had been coherent enough to share information. She deteriorated later on to the point where she was giving information that was incoherent. She had uh, what the doctors described to us uh, at, at least three home run type swings to the head. Her hand was broken, her arm was injured badly. Her skull was uh, badly enough indented into her brain that she had uh, bleeding to her brain. With such severe injuries, the detectives realize that Misty's memory may be vague and unreliable, but she is their only lead. In medical terms, Misty has received a blunt head trauma. Montreal forensic pathologist, Dr. Annie Sauvageau explains. Blunt trauma to the head will often erode the scalp, but also cause cuts because the weapon hits the scalp and the bone is underneath. The scalp is caught between two hard objects, the weapon and the skull so the scalp will open, it will tear. That's what we call a laceration. If the weapon strikes hard enough, the skull will also break and you'll have a skull fracture. Whether the skull breaks or not, the brain may be damaged and blood may pool around the brain. This blood will cover the brain and it may cause a chemical irritation, making the brain swell. So if we have a brain that is swelling but no holes in the skull, the brain will try to find a way to eliminate the excess pressure. That excess will come out through holes in the base called the foramen magnum, where the marrow is generally located. So bits of brain go there, but there is still not enough room for the swelling brain and it compresses important centers that control the respiration, the pulse, and the blood vessels. And this can lead to death. The doctors and police are amazed that Misty managed to get to the hospital with such severe injuries. The remarkable thing about it was that uh, the attack happened at about uh, midnight, 12.30, and she never came into the hospital until about 4.30 in the morning. She'd been lying outside on the ground, and she managed to find her way around to the front to the emergency ward and stumbled through the doors. And that was, of course, a question that we had. We thought perhaps somebody even had helped her to get there. She was beaten so badly. In an effort to find witnesses or information relating to the crime, the police issue a press release and set up a tip line call center.
In the meantime, investigators try to piece together statements made by Misty to help them locate the crime scene. What we had for Misty was she was over by the school in the bushes. So that's a fairly large area, which included behind the hospital. And we had detective teams going through the bushes area, uh, behind the hospital, behind the school, and all down that particular street. After three days, there's still no trace of the attack site. Given her critical condition, could Misty have inadvertently misled them? The town of Abbotsford, British Columbia is in mourning. Two young girls have been violently attacked on their way to a party. Misty Cockrell barely escaped the attacker and is in critical condition in the hospital under police protection. 16-year-old Tanya Smith has been found dead in a river, her body beaten and mutilated. The police are still looking for the scene where the attack took place. It wasn't, in fact, until the morning of the 18th, four days later, that we were able to establish the actual attack site by finding a hoop earring that had been knocked off of uh, Misty. The attack site is finally confirmed, in spite of the fact that the rain has washed away the girl's blood. It was late at night, but there are residents in that area. Uh, there were people that heard screams, and at least two witnesses that heard a, a female voice saying, no, no, no. Nobody phoned the police, however, but uh, that's not unusual either. So it's a high-risk attack and high-risk area. Sometimes that's part of the thrill of it for these guys. That same day, police receive a report of an object that may be of interest, located not far from the Veda River. A local farmer that knew we were looking for evidence out in that area phoned in and said, I've, I can see a baseball bat floating in the ditch. Don't think it was there yesterday. Misty had told the police that her assailant beat her with a baseball bat. Could this be the weapon used during the attack on Misty and Tanya? The police have the bat examined by RCMP Forensics. That same day, Inspector McLeod answers a call on the tip line. The first time he called, uh, I was in the, um, in the command room and uh, picked up the, the tip line. At the other end of the line, a man claims to be the person who found Misty and helped her get to the hospital. Inspector McLeod tries to obtain more information, but the man hangs up without identifying himself. The stranger was using a public payphone, and the police were unable to trace the call. Later in the afternoon, another call astounds the police. The same man who spoke earlier with Inspector McLeod now gives details regarding the body of the victim found in the river. He claims to be Tanya Smith's killer and proves it by mentioning details that were not released to the public. It's not likely that it could have been done by anyone else other than the perpetrator. The information, the main piece of holdback information that we had was the location of the bite on, on Tanya's body. And the caller, when he called us, always referred to that uh, area of the bite as his calling card, so to speak. This time, the call is traced back to a payphone at the Abbotsford Arena. Police and the Forensic Identification Unit are immediately dispatched. We were getting the information within uh, minutes for uh, the timing of the phone call being made and the time it took to drive to the exit. Uh, we feel that the first police responders must have met him as he was driving out. The response was that quick. Unfortunately, it didn't uh, identify him. Telephone receivers generally are quite greasy and dirty and, and you may get uh, prints on top of prints, hard to determine if it's one individual or, or not. Um, it's a public area and you're, you're not going to get uh, good results. But to actually find something that's usable is um, pretty slim. Early that evening, 
the tips line receives another call from the killer. This time, he mocks the police and laughs at their inability to catch him. One of his phone calls to us, he said, do you think I'd be stupid enough to leave fingerprints behind when I made a phone call? And that led us to believe that he was watching us dust the payphone uh, where the 911 call was made. The same evening, the killer calls a fourth time. He continues to taunt the investigators and admits he's looking for new victims. He wants to kill again. To help apprehend the killer, a telecommunications company develops a new technology to assist the investigation. They were able to uh, put in a uh, remote answering system that would show us uh, when a 911 call was coming into our dispatch center from a payphone, and before the dispatcher answered that call, she'd be able, he or she would be able to tell where that phone call was coming from, which payphone it was coming from, and dispatch a car to be attending there, and then answer the, pay, answer the 911 call and uh, talk to the person. And during the time that they were talking to the person, uh, there would be a police car en route to this 911 call. We saturated the streets of Abbotsford with as many investigative teams as we possibly could in anticipation he was going to call. Um, in those areas that he had called in the past, so that if there was a call, we could respond quickly, and we did. Patrol cars arrive on the site shortly after the call, but the killer escapes once again. The police make another statement to the media warning the city of Abbotsford that this violent predator is on the loose. They request that women in particular be very careful. The community is gripped by fear. The tip line receives thousands of calls from people wanting to help catch the murderer. The investigators receive the results from the analysis of the baseball bat. No DNA evidence was found. The bat cannot be linked to the crime. Misty is still in critical condition, but she is the only one who has seen the murderer. The police send a forensic artist to visit her to create a composite drawing. In her brief moments of consciousness, she describes her assailant. On October 20th, six days after the attack, the face of the Abbotsford killer appears in all the newspapers. We had, of course, um, released a composite that Misty had assisted in preparing. We had debated about the, uh, the value of that, given her injuries, but we decided to release that. That generated a lot of uh, tips from the public. The police follow up on all the tips they receive from the public. It's a long, laborious process. The cause of Tanya's death can only be confirmed with an autopsy. Will the evidence found on her body offer the investigators a solid lead? Detective Kevin Hackett is present at the autopsy. She had very significant uh, skull fracture. She had trauma to her face. It looked like she'd been uh, beaten around the face. And uh, in her abdomen area, uh, an almost visible footprint it, with some of the soil that was left, and there was the significant um, injury, the bite mark, uh, to her uh, breast. Tanya's body was in the river for many hours. It's quite possible that the water has washed away precious evidence. Could the analysis of the bite mark help identify the murderer? Will it give police the evidence they need to arrest the Abbotsford killer? town of Abbotsford, British Columbia, is in shock. Two teenage girls have been violently attacked. One is dead, and the other is struggling to stay alive. A man who identifies himself as the murderer has been calling and taunting the police. He has threatened to kill again, spreading terror through the city. Investigators work around the clock searching for leads. The results of Tanya Smith's autopsy may give them the evidence they need to stop the murderer before he claims another victim. Uh, although 
Dr. Carlisle believed that the head injuries, brain injuries were so significant that she likely would have died from them. But the official cause was drowning because she was submerged in the water and still inhaling uh, water into her lungs. The pathologist also finds that the victim has been raped. Samples are sent for DNA profiling. To examine the bite mark on the victim's breast, the police call on Dr. Sweet, a forensic odontologist with an international reputation. When we collect bite mark evidence, there's a specific protocol that we follow, and it included swabbing the skin as an initial examination, and then looking at the physical evidence that result from the teeth interacting with the skin. We had to photograph the bite mark extensively in order to record those patterns and shapes in reference to a scale or a ruler that's placed uh, near the bite mark. And in addition to that, we take a cast or we make a mold of the skin so that we can record any um, undulations or differences in the surface from normal. Dr. Sweet uses a new technique to collect DNA from the bite mark. The saliva that is deposited during biting, I thought would be a very good source of DNA evidence. And so I had developed a method of collecting that saliva using two swabs, one wet and one dry. Because the victim had been in the water for several hours, there was really no way of knowing what we were going to be able to achieve. It was assumed that the water would have washed away all of the evidence. The swabbing method involves using two swabs. The first one is uh, dipped in sterile distilled water to wet it so that the dried stain that's on the surface of the skin can be hydrated and loosened. The uh, discovery that we made when we were developing this method was that there are still cells from the saliva left in contact with the skin after the first swab leaves the surface. So if we could come back with a dry swab, a second separate swab, to act as a sponge, we can collect the water and the remaining cells that are now loose from the skin's surface. We were very surprised when we got a DNA result. And we started to look at why the saliva was acting like this, why after several hours in the water, we were still able to obtain a result. Saliva contains a viscous substance called mucin. That's what held the suspect's DNA on Tanya's skin. Part of the saliva was lost in the river, but there was enough left to produce a partial DNA result. For the investigators, this is an important discovery. A full DNA profile was produced from the semen sample that was found in the postcoital swab but a partial DNA profile was produced from the bite mark. But enough of the DNA profile was obtained in order to compare that not only with the semen to show that the same person that had sex with the victim also bit her. Police hold back this information from the public to ensure that the murderer is not aware of the evidence found. After 12 days of silence, the Abbotsford killer calls the police again. This time, the call comes from a phone booth outside the recreation center. Patrol cars race to the scene, but once again, the killer escapes. The investigation is stalling. The police are aware of the stress on the city, and they have to stop the terror. They turn to forensic psychology. When the police call on forensic psychologists, it's usually because there's something strange in the behavior of the individual that they can't understand. Uh, it's, it's something out of the ordinary. In these cases, they'll ask a psychologist to do a, a psychological profile of that individual. There's a danger, though, uh, that you have to be mindful of as an investigator or as a, as a team commander. And the danger is tunnel vision and uh, focusing uh, too much on that profile. 
and ignoring other um, avenues of investigation or other people of interest or other evidence that doesn't fit with the profile. But um, it can be a valuable tool, but you have to be very careful in how you use that tool. Dr. Mike Webster is brought in to prepare a psychological profile of the murderer. This was a spontaneous act. This was a retaliatory type of crime that he committed here. Any sexual overtones were secondary. They were simply another way to brutalize and dehumanize these girls. This was an act of, of savage retaliation. Tanya and Misty presented an opportunity for him. He physically intimidated them, and he psychologically intimidated them. Part of his motive was to blow off some of this anger, this steam that he had uh, against women. And, and this is unusual because, um, I mean, usually when someone commits a crime, post-crime behavior is they want to distance themselves from their crime so that they won't be discovered. In this case, he had a desire to demonstrate to the police that he was smarter than they were that he could outwit them. And what he had done here by going to the river was in effect create two crime scenes attempting to complicate matters for the police. The telephone calls that came afterwards, this was his way of involving him in himself in the investigation. This was his way of maintaining the excitement of the crime by continuing to interact with the police and demonstrate to them that he could outwit them, that he was smarter than they were. 24 days after the attack, the police set up a call-in line where people can listen to samples of the killer's phone calls. They hoped that someone would recognize his voice. I think what really started to scare the community is when he started making phone calls and taunting us, and then we started to play those on the air. I think it really scared people. And it was quiet around town. You could drive downtown at night, and there wasn't a lot of traffic out. You didn't see people out walking. Uh, people were scared. Finally, on December 1st, there is a new development in the investigation. And we had a suspect that uh, had been arrested on this particular um, as, as being identified as a person um, responsible for the attacks. And he was a look-alike, a dead ringer for the uh, composite drawing. The suspect gives a DNA sample and his dental imprint. Have the police arrested the Abbotsford killer? violent murderer is hiding in the small British Columbian city of Abbotsford. He terrorizes the community, taunts the police, and promises to kill again. Misty Cockrell, one of his young victims, clings to life in hospital. A composite drawing is published in all the newspapers. A recording of the killer's voice is broadcast on radio and television. On December 1st, investigators arrest a man who bears a striking resemblance to the composite drawing. He is well known to police and agrees to give a DNA sample and his dental imprint. He was really, really quick to give all the uh, DNA and bite mark, we didn't have a fingerprint at that time, but he gave DNA and a bite mark to get himself cleared. The suspect is held in custody while the DNA samples are examined. In the meantime, the police continue their investigation. I was asked to record dental impressions on five different suspects over a period of about six months. I had seen traits in the teeth that were quite characteristic and unique. So I was able to take impressions of those suspects' teeth and when the, within a very short period of time, exclude them as being the cause of the bite mark. Over the course of the investigation, there was 9,500 tips came in and most of those were 
people being identified as possible suspects. So we're getting look-alikes to the composite drawings and sound-alikes to the voice, and people were very, very anxious to, to help, and uh, we were getting lots of calls. So thousands, thousands of suspects were eliminated. The DNA results are negative, and the suspect is released. He is not the Abbotsford killer. The killer has not contacted the police for weeks. His silence weighs heavily, and his threat to kill again echoes through the streets of the city. On February 17th, the host of a radio show receives an anonymous call. The man tells him to go and look in the parking lot. I quickly realized that it said Tanya Smith on the gravestone, and there was an embossed picture. And so he called the police right away. And our officers attended and took the headstone as evidence and found that it had been um, defaced. There was threats scribbled on it to Misty. There was uh, a reference uh, on it to the bite mark. And quite amazingly, nobody saw him lift this big 180-pound headstone out of there and put it on the hood of the car. So it was, uh, it was like we were chasing a, a ghost, eh? This guy's invisible. The kind of person who proceeds like that, who deliberately puts out clues, makes sure the victim will be recovered quickly and identified, their main purpose is really to get some attention, improve their self-image, which may be very ordinary, in fact. Two days later, the killer calls the police and asks them if they liked his gift. The provoking call is made from a payphone booth, only two streets from the police station. He disappears yet again without leaving a trace. Witnesses give police descriptions of a man they had seen, but the leads do not produce a suspect. On February 21st, four months after the attack, the killer makes contact for the eighth time. He just picked a residential street. He had walked up to the front of this house and, and right through the front uh, living room window, he heaved this wrench. Corporal Mike Colson, he is a forensic identification technician uh, for the Abbotsford Police, and uh, he spent a long time very, very carefully taking this package apart. And of course, when you get a letter, the temptation is to rip into the letter and find out what's inside. Never forget the night we've read that note for the first time, and uh, just chills going up my spine. It was absolutely terrifying, horrific. The wrench was taped to an envelope with a letter inside. It was typewritten with no punctuation. In it, the killer brags of having committed three other attacks. He included newspaper clippings and details that allow the police to confirm his claims. There is no doubt that Tanya and Misty are not his first victims. He talked about other conquests, uh, and in the end he said, you won't catch me. Uh, I'm not going to move out of town, and I will strike again. And goodbye for now, guys. And it was written sort of almost in a friendly format, so it was really a strange letter. The forensic expert examines every square millimeter of this package, handling it with extreme care. He finds no prints on the clippings, no prints on the letter, no prints on the envelope. However, on closer examination, the piece of tape holds an obscured clue. And if you think about tearing a piece of tape off a roll, you're using your thumb and your index finger. And um, again, looking at the process, normally you would tear a piece of tape with your index finger on the sticky side. And uh, that's what we keyed in on. They use a new technique designed for difficult media like adhesive tape. He used a powder called sticky side powder, which is basically a, 
a powder that you mix with a solution that suspends the powder and then you wash it over the the tape and it'll stick to the to the glued side of the of the tape where the finger had touched. Will the police find the fingerprint of the Abbotsford killer? Has he finally made the fatal mistake that everyone has been waiting for? Abbotsford, British Columbia is on high alert. For the last five months, a murderer has been terrorizing the city and provoking the police. He has desecrated the grave of his victim, Tanya Smith, who was found beaten, raped, and drowned. Tanya's friend Misty has survived the attack but is under police protection because the murderer has threatened to kill her. The police examine a letter that the killer had thrown randomly through a house window. The forensic expert applies a special solution designed to detect fingerprints on tape, but he sees nothing. He puts the sample under a microscope looking for hair or fibers. That's when he found the fingerprint. It was so faint. So then he photographed it and went in the dark room and just kept on darkening and darkening and darkening until it, uh, until it came up. The police now have an extremely valuable piece of evidence, an index fingerprint of the Abbotsford killer. The discovery is held back from the media so as to not alert the murderer. We had DNA and we knew there was a bite mark, um, but again, we had nothing to compare it to. And um, not until we found the print did we have something that we could actually start comparing it to uh, suspects. The print is sent to the Canadian Fingerprint Database for comparison. The result is negative. The print is also sent to the FBI and other American agencies, but again, there are no matches. Our whole perception of who we were after changed. We were thinking before it would be somebody that had a record for sexual assault or assault or some, something like that, a known criminal or some kind of criminal record. And in fact, he did not have a criminal record at all. Seven months after the attack, the police digitally enhance the recorded phone calls from the killer and make them public. We'd set up a phone line at the police office, which is a dial-in line, and you could phone in and listen to the tape to you know, determine for yourself if you recognized it. The next day, a woman calls the police. Hello? She phoned our tips line and uh, told one of the uh, tip takers, yeah, this is, I think that's my son's voice, and uh, he fishes at the Vetter River, and he went to Tanya Smith's funeral. She knew that. Could the murderer have been turned in by his own mother? We attended at his uh, residence in Abbotsford, and uh, treated him like we treated every other person of interest that had been surfaced through the investigation. And I offered him the chance to come in to talk voluntarily and provide his fingerprints and uh, provide a DNA sample. And uh, he declined to do that. The investigators are suspicious of his response. We had very few people that did not cooperate. Anyone that was approached by the police as a suspect or a person of interest, uh, were very quick to uh, cooperate to eliminate themselves. This uh, was such a horrific crime against a child that uh, no one wanted anything to do with that. And we had some pretty hard-nosed criminals uh, cooperate with us. The police cannot force a citizen to provide a sample for DNA analysis without a warrant signed by a judge. McLeod continues to investigate the suspect. The man's name is Terry Driver. He is married with two young children. He works in a printing house and has no criminal record. And his father is a retired police officer. On the advice of his family, Terry Driver agrees to give his fingerprints, but nothing else. Accompanied by his lawyer, he walks into the police station. I rolled his prints, but we'd been looking at that print so many times. Uh, we had that ingrained in our mind. We knew what we were looking for. Under normal circumstances, I would have taken the print and gone back into my office, but 
This was a little bit of a unique situation. He had his lawyer there. There was uh, they wanted it done right there at that at that spot. So I went into a small office that's normally occupied by the guard and uh, closed the door. But there's windows all around, so you felt like you're in a bit of a fishbowl situation. And um, they wanted me to make the comparison at that time. There was a, a center portion of it that had a funny um, bit of a loop on it, and, and we kind of had a nickname. We dubbed it the hockey stick. And that was kind of an area that we keyed in on um, right off the bat to look to see if that formation was there. And when I uh, compared the prints, put the fingerprint glass on it, and started looking at some of the areas that we had keyed in on, I could feel my heart rate was accelerated. And then, of course, when I looked at the print right off the bat, uh, it, it's, uh, it didn't take me very long, and uh, I knew that it was his print. Jerry Ennis checks the print again. He is confident that it is identical to the one found on the tape attached to the note signed by the killer. The investigators have their first solid piece of evidence. They can now build the case that Terry Driver is the Abbotsford killer. Everything from uh, tears in the eyes to high fives and hooting and hollering. It was, uh, it was very, very big relief off of everybody's shoulders. And you could tell the uh, weight of the world lifted off all of our shoulders because the bad guy was now at least in custody. The threat was over. When there's an arrest made, uh, as far as the police are concerned, that's really when the work starts because now you're, the clock is ticking to get ready for trial. The police continued to collect evidence against him uh, afterwards, for example, the, the cell phone tracking evidence, uh, the bite mark comparison evidence was only available when police were able to get his dental impressions. The uh, DNA from him was only available once uh, police knew that it was his DNA they needed to obtain. It is now up to Crown Prosecutor Neil McKenzie to prove that Terry Driver is guilty. The trial charges him in connection with both victims attempted murder in the case of Misty Cockrell, and first-degree murder in the case of Tanya Smith. Before the court, Terry Driver makes 20 admissions. Most surprisingly, he admits to the rape and manslaughter of Tanya Smith. Mr. Driver's position was that he was, he was guilty of a sexual assault and guilty of a manslaughter because he had uh, put Tanya Smith's body in the river, and she had drowned a, a, as a result. And so the manslaughter would be as a result of his unlawful act of, of uh, putting her body in the river. Uh, he claimed at that time that he believed uh, that she was already dead and only realized later that, uh, that she had drowned when he heard news reports. So then he realized that he was responsible for the death, and that was why he according to him, was guilty of manslaughter, but not of murder. I think what he said on the stand was that he had sex with Tanya. That's consistent with the evidence. But then there's no direct evidence that says that he was the person that threw her in the river and, in fact, killed her because she drowned. What went against that, of course, was the fact that he'd written a letter talking about a baseball bat. And uh, he had um, talked about being the one that took Misty around to the front of the hospital and dropping her off. And in fact, he hadn't, he hadn't done that. Justice Opal came up with a number of reasons that he found his story not credible. And uh, he convicted him. It is almost exactly two years after the attack on the teenage victims. Terry Driver is convicted of first-degree murder in the case of Tanya Smith and attempted murder in the case of Misty Cockrell. He receives a life sentence with the possibility of parole after 25 years, which is the minimum for first-degree murder. At a separate trial, Terry Driver is also found guilty of the three attacks that he confessed to in the note thrown through the window. Basically, uh, members of the team put their lives on hold for seven months and went after this case uh, to investigate it and identify the killer. Um, these guys lived in the community. We all lived in the community. We all knew the threat, and the threat was to our families as well. And uh, it was one of those cases that 
if it comes along once in your career, that would be too much. Terry Driver used water to become the Abbotsford killer and forever left a scar on the community. But for Tanya and Misty, justice has been served. of life and cause of death, water can wash away clues, dilute evidence, and conceal corpses. For investigators, water can be a cunning opponent. For criminals, a most accommodating ally. For the perfect crime, just add water. It was one of the most sinister crimes ever committed in British Columbia. The investigation begins in the cold, powerful waters of the Fraser River near Vancouver and ends in a crack house that is as well known to police as it is to the addicts and sex trade workers who gather there. The resulting trial will be one of the most difficult ever held in the province. In 2001, RCMP Detective Peter Cross is the lead investigator assigned to a particularly mysterious case, what is commonly referred to as a John Doe homicide. We had some information that somebody had been killed inside a house in the north part of Surrey. On May 12th, 2001, an individual came forward to the police and he, he wasn't an informant, he was a witness and he, he spoke of having viewed not a person being killed, but the aftermath of such. We were investigating that, even though we had no idea who the victim was. There was pretty good information. The house where John Doe was reported to have died is located in Wally, a low-income neighborhood in Surrey. It's a rundown area and has a high level of crime and violence because of the number of drug addicts who continue to feed their habit. The investigators decide to request a warrant to search the house. When we searched the house originally, uh, we did it in such a way as the, the occupants of the house didn't necessarily know what we were looking for. While conducting the search, the investigators make some gruesome discoveries. Peter Cross dubs it the House of Horrors. The reason it became termed the House of Horrors um, is that we eventually did search warrants on the residents on two different occasions, actually. And on one occasion, uh, we went in and looked for fingerprints, for blood, for anything along those lines. And some of those, uh, the blood impressions were pretty graphic because one was a palm print, you know, on a floorboard in blood. So you know that, that this is not something that's the result of somebody using needles or something. It's something that's the result of a crime. The house is a disaster and should be demolished. Inside it was totally shabby and run down. There's food everywhere, there's garbage everywhere, there's property everywhere. Filthy clothes and cigarette butts and empty alcohol bottles and cans and drug paraphernalia. And it's filthy. We found piles and piles of new clothes uh, with tags on them. So obviously, they're stealing the clothes to, in exchange for the dope. It was what normally you'd encounter in what they call the crack shack. There were a number of drug users in the residence at the time, as well as the tenant and, and some of his associates. According to police, the tenant Joe Lagasse was the person running the house and dealing the drugs. Some people come forward with disturbing information. They were telling horrendous stories about um, the torture, where if they didn't come up with the $25 or $50 they needed, that they would get their hair cut or, you know, they get a finger broken or they'd be made to have sex with other people in the house. I've been on the job 30 years, so you see a lot of violence. 
I think the concentrated form of this violence in this one house um, to, to what these sex trade workers were going through, um, it's the kind of file that sticks with you because of that, you know, and the level of violence for such little money. When you combine that with the information that we're getting from all these people on the street about how people are being beaten uh, and tortured in that residence, it kind of gives you a good picture of what might be happening. One of the women at the house during the search offers some particularly troubling information to the investigators. She was a, a heroin addict, very down and out. And in, in the midst of her interview, she broke down and she she finally told us, you know, I know about the homicide um, and started referring to the victim as a, a she as opposed to a he. And that kind of cued everybody in that something else was going on here. And, and we, we felt that she was reliable. She had a lot of good information. The woman said she was at the house a few weeks earlier when a girl was being tortured in the bathtub. She actually walked in to use the bathroom when this was going on. So that was the main tie-in, uh, the primary evidence that we had at that time. Because of her confession, a number of other drug addicts overcome their fear and come forward with their own information about the incident. These people were all really scared. Talking to the police in that world is not looked upon fondly, and you know they all feel very endangered by it. So it was a struggle to get any information from anybody. But that's predominantly how we started understanding that another, at least one other person, had been killed there. And we were about two or three weeks into that investigation when the body floated up in New Westminster. In June of 2001. A passerby discovers a body floating by the dock in New Westminster Quay, a city near Vancouver. He alerts the police immediately. Forensic identification officer Fred Ralston is dispatched to the scene. It was on uh, June 4th, 2001. I was working a, a day shift and I just got a phone call that they had recovered a uh, body in the Fraser River and they just wanted us to come down there and take some photographs before they had taken her out of the river. There were a number of uh, police officers there at the scene and uh, I noted that there was a body in the, in, the, uh, in the river and it was face down but it was fairly obvious just from the general outline of the, of the person that it appeared to be female. Facial features and all those kinds of things are, are definitely blurred. Of course, water being the most difficult body to find as far as a forensic, because water destroys and animal life destroys what you have fairly quickly. The current is very strong. The rescuers must work quickly so that the body is not carried away by the river. Our first concern was to try to get her out of the water without disturbing the body and more importantly, not letting her go and head down the Fraser River again. So after some discussion, uh, we decided that the uh, dive team from the RCMP would, would come there and retrieve the body. The New Westminster Police Department doesn't have its own dive team. The RCMP divers must be brought in. The feet and, and hands were bound together. Quite frankly, that's suspicious enough for us to, to call in homicide. Um, Generally speaking, you don't get anybody trying to commit suicide uh, or trying to drown themselves uh, with their feet and hands tied together. So it, it was evident to us that uh, this was in fact a homicide and we had to be very careful in the extraction of the body. We bagged the body in the water. That way we're, we'll preserve things like paper falling out of pockets or, or perhaps an earring. And then we cut little slits in the bag and let the water rush out that way. The idea, of course, is to get the water out of the bag because it, it, water weighs, you know, an awful lot. But it drains in such a way that we can preserve items that might fall out. In this particular case, you want to double that up with a Stokes stretcher uh, so that you can, con you can actually control the amount of water that comes out, out of the bag at, at any given time. 
Once the body's up on dry land, it's almost immediately turned over to the homicide investigators. Uh, Detective Constable Meaden and myself, we went down, followed the body down to the uh, Royal Columbian Hospital morgue. And we went in there for obvious reasons, just to see if there was a wallet or anything on her that would tell us who she was. Many questions remain unanswered. How did the victim end up in the Fraser River? How long has the body been in the water? Will an autopsy be able to determine the victim's identity? The RCMP are investigating the murder of a man in a crack house known as the House of Horrors. They learn a woman has been beaten in the bathroom of the same house. At the same time, a body is discovered floating in the waters of the Fraser River near Vancouver, British Columbia. The body is transported to the morgue at the Royal Columbian Hospital in New Westminster. The pathologist conducts an autopsy on the badly decomposing body. Une autopsie uh, médico-légale. A forensic autopsy involves a number of steps. When the body arrives, the first step is an external examination. We look at the clothes and the skin. We're looking for signs of cuts or tears in the clothes, or signs of trauma in the skin. Is there any evidence there? Are there fragments of fiber that were torn from the attacker? Are there any body fluids from the attacker? Blood or semen? So we might take samples of any number of different things found on the clothes and skin. Then we undress the body, and we go through the same procedure without the clothes. When the body bag is opened, the sex is confirmed, but nothing is found that might help identify the woman. Bodies in water, especially when it's cold, uh, probably decompose less than if you had the body on the outside where it's exposed to the elements. She actually had a piece of uh, the um, packaging tape wrapped around the back of her head through her mouth and then around to the back of her uh, head again. So her face was distorted quite a bit. She was wearing a sweater and a pair of jeans, um, which might not have sig that much significance, except for the jeans weren't, were, were very obviously not her pants. They were brand new pants. They still had um, stickers and tags on them, uh, and, and they were too small. They, you know, somebody had had a struggle actually putting these, this clothing on her. Seven stab wounds were found on the woman's arms, back, and thighs. I did look at her hands because I knew that I'd eventually have to fingerprint her, and she had degloved, which is a way of saying that the outer layer of her skin had come off. But even at that, she was in very good shape, and I had no reason to believe that I wouldn't be able to get a good set of fingerprints from her that would be identifiable. Le liquide qui s'accumule dans le corps. As a result of decomposition, moisture accumulates in the body between the outer layer of the skin, the epidermis, and a deeper layer called the dermis. And the epidermis becomes detached. Around the hands, we are left with something like a glove, which must be removed very, very carefully. The forensic expert puts on a latex glove to protect their hand and then fits the salvaged skin over it in order to take the fingerprints. If this skin glove has been lost in the water and we have been unable to retrieve it, the forensic expert can still take fingerprints from the dermis. It's not as effective, but it still works. The victim's hands and ankles have been tied with yellow rope. They might be some unusual knot that a person might link to some particular job or hobby. And if it's preserved properly, the knot specialist can look at it and maybe give us some information. The rope bindings, we took some interest in and spent some a little time on that. We sent those off actually to a, a rope expert um, to determine knots and how they were tied. And we try to use that as a tie-in later on in the investigation. Once the victim's hands are untied, the forensic technician can start taking fingerprints. First at the postmortem, it was not possible to get a good set of fingerprints from her. So unfortunately, we had to remove all of the fingers. 
As soon as we were finished the post-mortem, we came back and we got four digits that were very, very good. Often when we find someone like that and, and we don't know who they are, that's the first thing we'll check. It's the easiest because if they've ever been involved in the justice system, we'll have their fingerprints on file. The only other reason we do it is for other people who pass away and we already know their identity. Uh, if they do have a criminal record, we'll take their fingerprints simply to send them into to Ottawa so they can be removed from the National Data Bank. Fred Rolston sends the prints from the four digits to the Vancouver database for verification. No matches are found. So the prints are sent on to be checked against the National Database in Ottawa. Despite Rolston's efforts, the second search yields nothing. I spent some time again, and I got all 10 digits, contacted Ottawa. I, it took them maybe a couple hours, and it came back, and it, again, it was negative. And I was disappointed because I felt if she'd been fingerprinted previously, there was no reason why they couldn't identify her, but they didn't. The fingerprints provide no leads. Have the investigators come up against the perfect crime? The team must now look for other clues that might reveal the woman's identity. There was a large uh, scorpion tattoo with uh, red eyes, and I think there's two red dots on the tail on her upper left shoulder. The scorpion tattoo was kind of the thing that we focused on in the early stages of the investigation as a possible means of, uh, of identifying her. They are now banking on the scorpion tattoo. Despite the condition of the body, they are able to take a clear photo. They release it to the media throughout the province. In the meantime, Constable Rolston receives fingerprints from four people who have been reported missing. He compares them to the victim's fingerprints. Once again, there are no matches. Then, he receives another lead. Finally, uh, someone had phoned in and said that there was a missing person in Coquitlam uh, that they hadn't seen for some time. So had the one of our, our uh, members go over to Coquitlam, pick up the prints and brought them back. A week has now passed since the body was discovered and the investigators are still empty handed. Will this latest lead help them solve the mystery of the victim's identity? A woman's body is found in the Fraser River, near a dock in New Westminster, British Columbia. It's badly decomposed. The investigators have just received the fingerprints of a missing woman from the neighboring city of Coquitlam. This time, the prints match. The woman can finally be identified. Her name is Annette Allen. I know that she was from Saskatchewan. Um, I believe that she had a mom still in Saskatchewan, and I believe that she had a brother as well. Annette has lived in British Columbia for some time, but she has no family there. Her disappearance was never reported. She had started dating uh, an individual who was heavy into drug use and the drug trade, and. He went off to jail, actually, a short time after they started dating, and Annette moved into a relative's of his. Because she came and went and wasn't very consistent with the way that she lived her life, the lady that she was living with didn't even realize that she was missing until her body was found, and, and they broadcast through the media the pictures of the tattoos. In cases like this, especially where there is trauma that may have contributed to the death, it is standard procedure to order toxicology tests. The results reveal high levels of drugs in Annette's system, consistent with those of a drug addict. She did have what would be um, a textbook lethal dosage of heroin in her system. She also had cocaine and um, I believe alcohol. Once Annette's identity is discovered, the New Westminster Police Department contacts Peter Cross. They believe there is a connection to the John Doe case he is currently working on. And 
And so we investigated a little further and we were able to tie the girl to this particular house that we were already investigating. The case is immediately transferred to the Surrey detachment of the RCMP, and Peter Cross becomes the lead investigator. The investigators learn that Annette Allen used to frequent the Stroll, an area of Wally where prostitutes ply their trade. They also discover that she was with a woman named Joanna Larson on April 22nd, the day she was last seen alive. Joanna Larson had brought her to that house. Um, and the information at that time was that Joanna Larson uh, had, a, had a beef with Annette Allen. And there's where sort of the real crux of the investigation started. What happened in that house? It was linked quite quickly that, that she had passed away in that house or, or that it had started there. The investigators still do not have enough evidence to make an arrest. So a second, more thorough search of the house is ordered. We took the drain pipes out of the house. Uh, we did everything. I would say we spent in total probably two and a half, three days examining that house. Peter crosses her disturbing rumors about the backyard of the House of Horrors. We had so much information of people coming forward, the street people in particular. We thought, we've got to cover this off. There's just too many people talking about bodies in the backyard. For the second search, he decides to use an untried technology called ground-penetrating radar. At the time, Cross is one of the first people in his detachment to use it. You can use it for pretty well anything. What you get is just like a radar image uh, that you would see on a scope that you see when they're running radar anywhere. And it will bring out the shape and size. So if you're looking for a coffin or you're looking for uh, a shotgun, the shape will actually come back at you. And what it measures is the disturbances in the soil. If you're looking for a body, it's going to show up as a body. The radar reveals no sign of bodies buried in the backyard. Well, we sort of came to the conclusion that <clears throat> this was one of the, the ways they threatened people that were coming into the house. The second search warrant leads to the discovery of 27 oh, DNA profiles in the house. But it does not yield a single trace of Annette Allen or any evidence of her murder. Either the informants are lying or someone has done a very thorough job of covering up their crime. To this day, we have still 27 unknown DNA profiles. Um, all those DNA profiles are blood profiles. So that's blood that's been expended in that house from 27 different people. Um, and we still have yet to tie it into anybody in particular. The House of Horrors is shut down, and Joe Legassi is arrested and charged as an accessory to the murder of Annette Allen. But he is quickly released. After the preliminary hearing, I decided the evidence simply wasn't there in regards to Legassi, so he was not charged on indictment with murder or manslaughter. Although he was a promising suspect, Legassi now walks away a free man. It was a legal decision as opposed to a common sense decision, in my opinion, because of the legal loopholes in, in what his role was. I think the average member of the public, when they hear what his role was, they would say, well, of course he's guilty. Um, the problem is the legal system doesn't necessarily match up to what the average Joe thinks. The only leads the investigators have left are eyewitness accounts that point to two possible suspects, Joanna Larson and Francis Gauthier. Joanna Larson and Francis Gauthier would be considered friends. Francis was kind of the doorman of that house, um, worked and lived there, and, and Jojo went there all the time. We had information which made us believe that the two of them had actually discussed committing a homicide and that, um, you know, they kind of jided each other at points saying, oh, you couldn't kill anybody or you couldn't do it. The witnesses are drug addicts, and this does not help matters. Peter Cross is not sure their accounts are reliable. 
The nature of their drug illness makes them extremely difficult to deal with and extremely difficult to corroborate their information and, and count on. Cross decides to forge ahead with what little information he has. The investigative avenue we thought would work and would be our best avenue was the undercover route. The first undercover operation targets Joanna Larson. It's not long before she's providing information about her role in the death of Annette Allen. She was definitely, in my opinion, a braggart. Like, she was quite pleased to, to talk about it. It turns out that Larson had previously taken part in a robbery and was convinced that Allen had been an informant. We could confirm later on, obviously, that she wasn't in that case. But that was their belief, was that she was uh, ratting them out. There was also a $20 drug debt in there, too, that Annette owed someone $20, and that this was a, a bit of a point of contention with, with Joanna as well. Annette showed up, and they kind of coerced her into the house on the premise that, you know, she was going to be given some drugs. And I, I think it was pretty immediate after she entered the house and that they tied her up and put her in the bathtub. Annette Allen is assaulted, stabbed, and beaten with a hammer. Larson boasts about the part she played in the attack, but says a man named Francis Gauthier was the instigator. Basically, Joanna Larson confessed to being there and what happened, but put the majority of the blame on Mr. Gauthier. But Larson's accusation against Gauthier would not be admissible in a court of law. In order for it to be used as evidence, a confession from Gauthier himself would be required. They knew certainly, for sure, they knew Gauthier was involved. One thing to know someone's involved, it's another thing to have evidence that you can use against that person. And so that's why the second undercover operation was used. Joanna Larson is arrested and charged with the murder of Annette Allen. Police launched the undercover operation targeting Francis Gauthier. The challenge, of course, was hoping that they didn't somehow come together once we'd started the second so that one would talk to the other as to what was going on. Will Gauthier be as quick as Larson to give information to the undercover operator? Will his story be the same? Will police get the evidence they need to arrest Annette Allen's killer? The body of Annette Allen has been retrieved from the Fraser River. Her death is traced back to a crack house located in Surrey, British Columbia, that police refer to as the House of Horrors. However, two searches have not turned up the slightest trace of Annette's DNA in the house. The investigators have completed an undercover operation targeting Joanna Larson. Armed with the allegations Larson has made about Francis Gauthier, the police launch a second undercover operation. He was introverted, quiet, not very comfortable with himself. Obviously he has some violent tendencies to do what he did, um, but you don't get that same sort of killer impression from Francis Gauthier that you get from Joanna Larson. I think it was a little, a little bit more difficult for him to talk about it, but in the end he seemed quite pleased with himself as well. Gauthier eventually recounts his versions of the events. He was sleeping on the couch when all this, when Joanna Larson brought Annette Allen to this house and began torturing her. According to Gauthier, Annette Allen arrived at the house to buy drugs. As soon as she arrived, Larson forced her into the bathroom and started torturing, stabbing, and beating her. The torture continues for many hours. When she's had enough, she recruits Francis Gauthier to help her trunk Alan. What was referred to on the street as being trunked, and um, that term referred to being beaten, having your head shaven, and being thrown in a trunk and driven, driven around as you know, a form of punishment or a way of convincing you that you need to pay your bills. 
Annette is unconscious and barely alive. Francis and Joanna wrap her in a plastic shower curtain. Then they lock her in a trunk of a car that is parked beside the house. This residence also had normally multiple cars parked in the driveway, most of them without license plates or insurance. And it was kind of typical to have one good set of license plates and you just switch that to whichever car you chose to drive that day. Initially, it was still daylight, so they waited for a while down in the, uh, the Surrey area, the North Surrey area. Larson and Gautier drive around for several hours looking for a suitable place to dump Alan. They stop under the Alex Fraser Bridge. A heated argument erupts. While the two accomplices try to come to a decision, Alan manages to open the trunk. Larson and Gautier realize what's happening, and they tie her up before heading back out. In their state of panic, they don't notice that they've been spotted. The man goes home and calls 911 to report what he witnessed. Eventually, Larson and Gautier end up in New Westminster. Right at the New Westminster Quay. Like, uh, it was about 100 yards up from where the body was found. Alan begs them not to kill her. Gautier strangles her. and throw her body into the Fraser River. Gautier's confession to the undercover agents is the evidence the police need to lay charges against him. Gautier is arrested for the murder of Annette Allen. The arrests of Joanna Larson and Francis Gautier brings Peter Cross closer to his goal. But he knows he still has his biggest challenge ahead of him, putting the offenders behind bars. What makes this case especially difficult is the fact that the witnesses and informants are drug addicts. From an investigator's standpoint, it's, a, it's horrendous. And then when you get into the court process, it becomes even more horrendous. Totally unreliable. You might as well forget them coming in for an interview. It, you know, if they do, it's a bit of a miracle. Unlikely to come to the court, even though they know they're supposed to. So you'd have to spend, send the police off to pick them up and bring them in. We have a lot of challenges with memory, recollection, you know, how cognizant people were when the incidents occurred, fear, intimidation. We were told from the very beginning, you'll never get this to court because the people will never come through. Unless somebody's willing to step forward, you do not have a case. And it's a very difficult thing to prove. Peter Cross and his team have an enormous task ahead of them they begin preparing for the trials of Joanna Larson and Francis Gautier. Christopher McPherson is selected as Crown Prosecutor. 
His extensive experience as a defense lawyer dealing with drug addicts makes him the ideal person to prosecute this case. Maybe that gave us a bit of an advantage in the sense of I've dealt with people like this for years and years and years in my office or interviewing them. His experience also tells him he is facing an uphill battle in the case of Annette Allen. We knew there were problems with it from the very, from the get-go. Sure, there was, the, there was tape and there was rope and there was clothing, but none of that could be tied back to the house in any way. Um, it was just basic stuff you could get anywhere. There was nothing that one could say was the weapons that were used in the assault. There were knives in the house, but there was nothing that you could say was used. The beating and stabbing took place in the bathroom, in the tub, and there was certainly evidence of cleaning up with bleach and things like that. I think, as I recall, they checked the trap of the, of the tub, couldn't find anything. There was basically no physical evidence to tie Annette Allen to the house at all. Even though Annette had been wrapped in plastic, he finds it very surprising that investigators were unable to find any forensic evidence in the car. If we have, could have put Annette Allen in that car with a forensic evidence, that would have made the case a lot stronger. Without any forensic evidence whatsoever, the prosecution's success will depend on two things, the undercover operations and the accounts of drug-addicted witnesses both of which present significant problems. In Larson's case, it is by no means certain whether the information gathered during the undercover operation will be admissible in court. Some of the things she said contradict the evidence collected when the body was recovered. Because they were so drug addicted, just their sheer recollection or perception is just skewed. They, they don't remember things. So even if they're not trying to lie, it's like it's they don't have a complete grasp of what's going on around them anyways. With no forensic evidence and unreliable witnesses, the odds are heavily stacked against the prosecution. Three people have been charged in relation to the death of Annette Allen. Her body was found in the Fraser River in New Westminster, British Columbia in June of 2001. Joe Lagasse has been acquitted for lack of evidence connecting him to the murder. The prosecution is preparing cases against Francis Gauthier and Joanna Larson. The suspects and the witnesses are heavily addicted to drugs and this complicates the case considerably. Since these are the only witnesses available to the prosecution, one obvious solution presents itself. Investigators take the witnesses under their care and enroll them in a detox program so that they'll be able to participate fully in the trial. It's up to the cop to increase the credibility of the drug addict turned witness, and one of the best ways to do this is to convince and assist the addict in abstaining for at least the duration of the court process. And hopefully they can provide the support services they need to remain sober. It's not an easy task, but it's certainly worth a try. They did an amazing job with uh, two or three of the witnesses in making sure they were always there for them, taking them for coffee after, and you know, keeping them on the straight and narrow giving them a place to call if they started to feel like they were going to slip down to the other side. I've got to give the police a lot of credit, a lot of credit, because even though, you know, it's a killing in the middle of a, for the whole drug scene, they worked very, very hard and continued to work very hard right through the whole case. Because it was one of those cases that, okay, you've got enough evidence to charge a person, well, that's nice, but half your witnesses aren't going to come. But one of the witnesses that the investigators support becomes a key witness in the trial. She was a woman who came to the house to buy drugs. And had to use the washroom, and when she went in, Annette was in the, in the bathtub. And she saw her. There is one issue that complicates the case even more, determining the cause of death. 
one of the issues that came in court was the levels of toxicity in her body with the various drugs. One of the defense arguments was that the drugs killed her. So that became an issue in court because we basically had to show that she was a drug addict and therefore her levels of this, it wasn't like the average person taking drugs for the first time. And you know, yeah, she still had a really high, high level of um, drugs in her system at the time of her death. So there's, there are lots of questions like that. You know, were they injecting her with drugs? Is, is that not what actually happened? You know, was the time span much less than what they described? And you have to crack it up to, they were both using drugs at the time too, and you know, how accurate are those time frames? One thing I find whenever there's witnesses who are heavily addicted to drugs, time is completely elastic. To, to try to figure out when something occurred approaches the impossible. The prosecution has no tangible evidence, no cause of death, and unreliable witnesses. Finally, the trial date arrives, and the first person on the stand is Francis Gauthier. Following their preliminary hearings, which are several months apart, Francis Gauthier and Joanna Larson are charged with first-degree murder in the death of Annette Allen. It wasn't a case that improved with time. Some of the witnesses became even less reliable. And I eventually agreed to take pleas to manslaughter on both of them. The Crown was willing to take a plea with regard to manslaughter because predominantly when you're dealing, when all of your witnesses are precariously perched on the edge of being able to testify and not being able to testify, if you go to trial and you have 10 so-so witnesses and defense starts taking them, them down and ruining their credibility, you can often end up with no good witnesses. On November 5th, 2004, Francis Gauthier is sentenced to 18 years in prison for manslaughter. On June 2nd, 2005, Joanna Larson also receives 18 years. The court's decision represents an enormous victory for everyone involved in solving Annette Allen's murder. We all had a relationship with Annette Allen in the sense that we, we thought that she was a legitimate victim and that this never should have happened and it was tragic and horrific. We were pretty pleased with the 18 years uh, when it all is said and done because that's probably at the very high end of manslaughter that you'll ever see. I feel great every time I think about it, that it ended the way it did and that people went to jail and there was some justice for her death. For sure, my biggest lesson ever in being a police officer is that every one of those people have a story and a reason for where they are. And if you actually just sit down and listen, you're going to maybe have a little bit more understanding and appreciation for the spot they're in. We had a good investigative team. We did a good job on that file. It's one of those files that you're proud of at the end of the day. It's one of those files that you get asked about all the time. It's one of those files that people remember that that hit the media and the general public knows of it. And you actually, it's one of those cases where you actually see some good come of, of everything that you did. The outcome of the trial has repercussions in the community. We saw an impact on that little Wally community uh, where nobody seemed to pay attention to them and the neighbors constantly complained that the police wouldn't take them seriously. The mayor at the end of this, um, bulldozed the house and uh, destroyed it. And I think it was kind of a symbolic gesture to say, we're taking care of these things and these crack checks are gonna be disposed of and, and dealt with accordingly. To this day, the John Doe case is still being investigated. As years pass, hope fades that his death will ever be resolved. Joanna Larson and Francis Gauthier believed that they could outsmart the investigators in Annette Allen's case. But for them, Water proved to be an unreliable accomplice. Source of life and cause of death. Water can wash away clues, dilute evidence, and conceal corpses. For investigators, water can be a cunning opponent. 
For criminals, a most accommodating ally. For the perfect crime, just add water. Innisville, Ontario is a bedroom community 70 kilometers north of Toronto, a quiet recreation town on the edge of Lake Simcoe. On the afternoon of April 25th, 1996, a man walks along a trail at Innisville Beach Park. He notices splashing in the water about 100 meters from the shore. In the distance, a red canoe drifts away. He suddenly sees someone in danger of drowning, clinging desperately to a floating patch of ice. He calls for help. At first glance, this seems like an unfortunate end to a simple canoe ride on Lake Simcoe. However, appearances can be deceiving. Will investigators find they are piecing together a series of tragic errors made by a calculating mind? It's unusual to have someone out on the lake at uh, that time of year when the, when the ice is still so close to the shore. 15 minutes after receiving the 911 call, Innisfil Fire Rescue arrives at Alcona Park. The rescue boat is still stored for the winter, so the paramedics must get to the victim in a rowboat. The water temperature at the time was four degrees Celsius, and uh, there was still ice out on the lake. The rescuers reach the man nearly 45 minutes after the 911 call was placed. He is severely hypothermic and unable to speak. One of the fire rescuers at the scene actually asked him to uh, blink once for no, twice for yes. Was there anyone in the canoe with you? And he didn't respond. There are no signs of any other victims, so they return to shore. Alive but unresponsive, the man is rushed to the Royal Victoria Hospital in nearby Barrie, Ontario. Rescuers identify the victim as Winston Malcolm and find his address. The fire rescue team briefs Innisfil police with the victim's name and the few details they have of the incident. Officers then pay a visit to Mr. Malcolm's home to notify any relatives. They went to the residence to notify um, Jan that uh, Winston had been in this situation. She wasn't home, uh, and that caused them some concern. Several hours later, Winston begins to regain consciousness in the hospital. In a delirious state, he calls for his wife, Jan Marshall. He asks the nurse if Jan is alive. Knowing that Winston was brought in alone, the nurse immediately contacts police. Uh, he indicated that uh, he and his wife went out for a canoe trip just to practice their, their skills and that uh, his wife uh, was laying in the bottom of the canoe because she was cold. She was covered up with a, a sleeping bag and they paddled back and forth. And at one point they became uh, lodged on some ice. They both tried to uh, extricate themselves by use of the paddles pushing off on the ice flow at which time the canoe capsized, throwing them both into the water. Police already know there was nobody home at Mr. Malcolm's house. They fear Jan Marshall might still be at the lake. That same evening, police and fire rescue returned to search Lake Simcoe. They scanned the water and the shoreline at Alcona Beach Park where Winston was found. There is no sign of Jan Marshall. Darkness falls and the search is called off until morning. It was, a, it was a missing person case. Had she made it to shore? Or was she somewhere along shore? Um, had she succumbed to the water and drowned? They had no idea. The following morning on April 26th, Detective Inspector Ron Gentle coordinates a recovery team. He calls in the Ontario Provincial Police Dive Unit to begin searching for the body of Jan Marshall. At the time, I was approximately four hours away 
So it took a good portion of the day to, to pack up and to respond to the call. Detective Sergeant Tom McDonald dispatches officers to attend the scene and question witnesses. We had several witnesses uh, from shore who, uh, who saw uh, the gentleman in the canoe uh, starting at approximately 11 o'clock in the morning. Uh, he was observed. And throughout the course of the day, right up until the time that the canoe capsized at approximately uh, 3.30 in the afternoon. It appeared that the canoeist was uh, paddling just up and down along the ice and uh, as it would slowly move out, he kept paddling just up and down, um, going into deeper and deeper water as the ice flow moved out. None of the witnesses, and I think there were six or seven, that uh, watched from time to time from shore, uh, saw the canoe on the ice, saw the canoe in distress. You know, they saw him and only he. They never saw Jan. Um, they thought there was just one person in the canoe. Suspicions arise as the hope of finding Jan Marshall alive begins to fade. Dead or alive, she must be found in order for the investigation to proceed. We were told our inspector was going to be attending the scene because there was uh, rather some suspicion of foul play. Just an accumulation of the time of year, being out in a canoe with the ice still on the water, uh, and the flags were up. So that's, I think, when we first thought that uh, we're going to be a little more prudent with the collection of evidence on this one. We just were given a primary uh, target location, and we went out and searched it. The dive team starts from the public dock at Alcona Beach. The initial search area is 100 by 150 meters, and the water temperature is 4 degrees Celsius. The divers use a technique called sledding, which allows them to search a large area of the frigid lake very quickly. We dive in pairs. So the, basically two planing boards, a diver on each board being pulled with the, the vessel making way. It's attached uh, with rope to the back of the boat. And the divers uh, can manipulate the, the board uh, tilt it up if they want to go up, tilt down, sideways. Uh, it's, uh, you know, the versatility of the, the board. You can do anything you want. Uh, communicate with the boat operator if you want to speed up or slow down. And uh, we cover such a large area uh, using the sleds. And, uh, in, this, in this lake, Lake Simcoe, the visibility was 15 feet. So with two divers, uh, you're, you're covering a good swath at least a 20-foot swath with, uh, with the sleds. The divers come up empty-handed. The ice would come in closer to shore some days, and the wind would blow it out further. So we didn't have a specific search area. And uh, so we, uh, we did the best we could with what the information we had at the time. There's very few reference points when you look out into the water. To You can't say, you know, it's right next to that telephone pole. It's, 300 yards out and, you know, you go which way, a couple degrees, and you could be talking, you know, hundreds of feet. There is just enough time for one more dive before darkness forces the team to stop. Will they find the body of Jan Marshall? In April 1996, a man is rescued from Lake Simcoe, Ontario. His canoe had capsized, leaving him hypothermic in the frigid waters and unable to speak. Several hours after being admitted to the hospital, he informs a nurse that his common-law wife, Jan, was also in the canoe. Divers from the Ontario Provincial Police have been called in to assist the search. They do two dives on the first day. The first day, we just were given a primary uh, target location, and we went out and searched it. And uh, there was no luck in locating any debris from the the capsized canoe or the victim. On April 27th, the underwater search resumes, this time more intensely with an expanded search area. We're equipped with wireless communications. So the divers were, or had the ability to communicate with each other as well as communicating with the boat operator. And uh, 
So we just took turns rotating through the cycle of diving. And the water depths out there, they didn't exceed 35 feet. We didn't have the, uh, the tools of the GPS at the time in 96, so we physically went out and we placed markers. And the boat operator, he's got an area to maintain. It's some, whether you want to call it a Zamboni uh, style of searching, they just eliminate certain areas and just expand from there. Meanwhile, investigators talk with members of Jan's family. She'd actually been out to BC to visit her mother uh, just weeks prior and had uh, told her mother that, uh, that she was uh, considering moving out to BC and uh, leaving Winston. Could this suggest a possible motive for Jan's disappearance? Investigators look for more clues by comparing witness statements to those of Winston Malcolm. Winston's first statement is about why he and Jan were canoeing on icy Lake Simcoe at that time of year. The, the reason that he provided for being on a lake was that he had a uh, upcoming canoe trip planned in Algonquin Park for the uh, May 2nd weekend. Uh, he indicated that uh, he and his wife went out for a canoe trip just to practice their, their skills. The story Mr. Uh, Malcolm gave us was that uh, he lowered the canoe onto the car and she walked ahead and he picked her up en route. And when he picked her up, she complained about being chilly. And um, he unloaded the canoe at the waterfront, put it in the water, and she laid in the canoe and he went and parked the car. He came back and put a sleeping bag over top of her. And then he pushed off and he paddled. As she didn't paddle at all. Now, I'm not an avid canoeist, but I'm an outdoors person and uh, I have canoed. And I can't imagine somebody laying in the bottom of an uninsulated canoe. If you're chilled, um, I just find that would be a, a, a little cold. And her, um, her family were able to tell us that she had just recovered from pneumonia but she suffered late in the winter as well. So those two facts didn't make a whole lot of sense to us as well. But none of the witnesses saw Jan at the scene. Is it possible that she never got into the canoe in the first place? Witnesses from the shore said the canoe was sitting steady in the water, even. Whereas if you have a 200 plus pound man and a woman at the back of the canoe, because he described her laying in the bottom with her head on his knees, one would think the canoe would be tipped, obviously, to the rear, and nobody saw that. So the, the displacement that was described by the witnesses on shore and the positioning of uh, the, the two bodies in the canoe, as he described, didn't make any sense uh, as well. Curiously, the witnesses did not actually see the canoe capsize. In two separate statements made to the police about the accident, Winston contradicts himself. He gave two versions once again. One was that uh, they got hung up on the ice, that he paddled onto the ice and asked her to help shove off, and that the two of them shoved off from the same side and the canoe capsized. And another version is that she got up to paddle and, uh, and somehow off-balanced the canoe. Uh, so once again, it goes back to his, his statements. Um, none of the witnesses, and I think there were six or seven, that uh, watched from time to time from shore, uh, saw the canoe on the ice, saw the canoe in distress. They saw him and only he. They never saw Jan. Um, they thought there was just one person in the canoe. On the second day of the search, the dive team conducts two more unsuccessful dives. They are desperate to pinpoint the location where the canoe capsized. That same day, Winston is released from the hospital. Officers then pay a visit to ask him for help to find Jan. We asked if he could return to the site uh, and uh, it would uh, greatly assist our search if he could come out in the boat in the vessel and uh, give us a location where he suspected it occurred. the team does their third and final dive of the day. But once again, the frigid water of Lake Simcoe refuses to divulge its secret. Depending on the, the length of time that he was in the water, um, the survivor, 
he could have drifted quite a ways. Uh, Lake Simcoe is a large area, body of water, and uh, he could, yeah, he could drift quite a ways with the wind and the, the wave action. And uh, he put us out in left field, totally out of the picture. But that was the area he identified. So our third dive that day, we searched it, and there was nothing. The detectives begin to speculate. Was Winston's memory of the accident blurred, or did he intentionally put them on the wrong track? The dive team will spend one more day searching for Jan Marshall. To maximize their chances of finding her body, they turn to an unlikely source for help. The canoe that Winston Malcolm was paddling capsized on Lake Simcoe, Ontario. Rescuers managed to save him, but there is still no sign of his common-law wife, Jan Marshall. By this point, suspicions run high, but investigators still do not have enough evidence to know if they are dealing with an accident or a crime. On April 28th, the OPP dive team prepares for a third day of searching for Jan's body, but they struggle to find the spot where Winston capsized his canoe. Yeah, we, we had aerial photographs of the, uh, the shoreline, and we tried as best we could to pinpoint uh, where, the, uh, where the body was located or where the, uh, the mishap had occurred as far as the uh, capsizing of the canoe. Uh, we even considered using, at one point, satellite uh, images. The dive team turns to the local news media that covered Winston's rescue. They hope something was captured on videotape. The information came forward that when the fire department were out making the rescue, there was a cameraman on shore with the local television network. And so we were able to track down the video that he took, the footage, plus the cameraman himself. He attended the scene and he was able to give us the exact location where he was standing and the shot that he took communicated with a boat that was out on the water. We directed them into the location and they dropped a marker and then we concentrated around that marker. The dive team finally has a precise idea as to where they should look. Will they find the victim? And on the third day, we conducted the, the first dive and 15 minutes into the dive, we located the victim. Uh, the victim was lying on her left side uh, with her, she was uh, wearing a dark colored bomber style jacket. It was up over her head. Um, she was wearing brown pants with light colored socks. She had no footwear, which was in itself suspicious. Um, the, um, there was a coil of rope suspended above her and it appeared to be looped through the her belt loop on the back of her pants. And um, her hands were free. There was nothing in her hands. Once uh, she was located, I placed uh, our pelican marker, which was just uh, a weight. I tied it to her right ankle, and the marker surfaced. Uh, I followed the marker to the surface, making sure that it was unraveling all the way up. and. Uh, notified the, the members in the boat of my discovery. And I was also informed then that uh, my partner, Larry Scott, had located a patio stone. The dive team feels a sense of relief, both for Jan Marshall's family and for the detectives who can now proceed with the investigation. They came up to the, uh, the surface and notified us and um, we asked them when they came back and briefed us to take the video equipment down and to film the, uh, the scene because it, it was our body recovery scene. And uh, it, that is usually one of the largest pieces of evidence we have in, in any investigation, any death investigation. Well, like the old saying goes, a picture's worth a thousand words. Uh, when it comes to court, it uh, saves a lot of time on the stand trying to uh, describe a scene. And again, it's uh, subject to interpretation of what the, the member says. So it's nice that we can play the videotape in the courtroom. And this is exactly the way we found it. And uh, no questions asked. And the, uh, the plan was we were to return, videotape as much evidence as possible, uh, return to the dock, unload the camera, take it back to the South Skimpico uh, Police Service uh, office where the tape was to be reviewed, 
prior to disturbing the scene. Uh, that would allow us that if there was any area that uh, they wanted uh, focused, that we could return and everything was untouched, we can go back down and, and videotape it. Plus, it would allow the silt to settle from the initial videotaping. Then we, together, the investigators, the divers, and the forensic identification people, uh, we sat down and viewed the video and came up with a game plan on how we were going to proceed. So I got a good look at the water scene. And what was unique about this is that the, the lake bottom was purely sand and there was no vegetation, there, was, there were no rocks, and then suddenly there's this patio stone. There was no algae on it, there was no buildup of, uh, of anything at all. It seemed obviously out of place. Until everyone is satisfied that the videotape has accurately captured the scene, the evidence remains untouched. Then the divers begin the recovery. The victim was removed from the bottom 35 feet down we lowered a cage, uh, Stokes cage basket, next to the body. She was placed into the, the Stokes, and the divers uh, assisted raising the body. In this case, she was brought up with bags on her hands and over her head uh, in the Stokes basket, and she was put into a, um, a funeral body bag once she got to the surface. And then that way, the, um, um, the coroner could view her pronounced death, and then she was uh, put in the body bag. Once the body is in the boat, the team notices signs of trauma on Jan's forehead. Could it have been caused by foul play? Could it have come from the canoe? Could it have come from the paddle? Could it have come from the ice? You know, we, we just weren't sure. The victim is transported to the morgue. The patio stone and other evidence are taken to the forensic identification lab for testing. I asked the divers to go back and take several water samples from the lake, uh, from the surface of the lake. Uh, mid-level and from the bottom of the lake as well. Um, diatoms are small microscopic organisms that are unique to each body of water. If the autopsy finds that Jan died by drowning, the diatoms from the water samples will be compared to diatoms found in her tissue samples. If they match, it will prove that Jan drowned in Lake Simcoe. Those are important in drowning deaths to, to help us determine that ensure that the, the, the water the body is found in is the water that they were drowned in. The next day, the divers return and videotape a larger area around the scene to make sure they did not miss anything that could be used as evidence. They make a few more discoveries. There was a hiking style backpack, which was large enough to accommodate the patio stone. There was one female shoe was a bungee cord, and I believe that was it. The divers are satisfied that they have recovered all the evidence from Lake Simcoe. Now it's up to the investigative team to piece it all together. Suspicions are high around the circumstances of Jan Marshall's death. The evidence collected is pointing toward a cover-up. Will the autopsy uncover evidence that turns this canoeing accident into a homicide? Winston Malcolm has survived frigid waters in a canoe accident on Lake Simcoe, Ontario. Jan Marshall, his common-law wife, has suffered a different fate. Jan's body has been found in the lake along with a cement stone and a backpack. Detective Sergeant Tom McDonald is responsible for delivering the tragic news to Winston. Mr. Malcolm's reaction is rather unemotional. He asked if they recovered the canoe, if I'm not mistake. I believe that's what he asked. As the detectives leave Winston's house, something catches their attention. Detective Buchanan observed a location on his walkway where a patio stone had been freshly lifted. It left an impression in the ground, uh, the same approximate size of the, uh, of the patio stone. So obviously, um, that connection, although we still have to prove the patio stone came from his residence, 
Um, that was certainly enough to raise our suspicions. The investigators must resist jumping to conclusions and focus on building a strong case. Postmortem hadn't been done yet, um, so we still didn't know the cause of death. The fact that uh, Mr. Malcolm had told the police officer who went to the hospital Thursday night that uh, Jan was wearing big rubber boots, and the next day he had told Tom McDonald that he, she was wearing small shoes to find her shoeless in the water certainly caused us some concern as well. And um, of course, we'd also known at that point in time that Jan had told Winston um, that she wasn't happy and that she was going to end the relationship. And she told family members that uh, she planned on leaving by the end of May. As the events unfolded, you know, uh, we discovered uh, rather quickly that uh, the story that Mr. Malcolm had provided uh, was crumbling. Uh, nothing he said was consistent with what we discovered to be the truth. Investigators believe there is sufficient evidence to arrest Winston. Now remember, our grounds to arrest don't have to be to the extent that we could convict in court. We just have to have reasonable probable grounds to believe that he committed the offense. And so we can arrest on a, on a weaker level of, of proof than we'd need to convict him in court. Uh, it was our belief that she'd been uh, killed in the home and uh, transported from the home to Lake Simcoe, uh, where her body was disposed of, and that in pushing the body overside, the canoe was not a very stable vessel to be putting anything large in and throwing it over, overboard. And uh, we uh, theorized that in the action of throwing her overboard, he capsized the canoe. But uh, our fear was um, that uh, Mr. Malcolm was certainly uh, you know, a wise man and would know that, uh, that we were probably theorizing what had taken place, and we were afraid he's going to destroy evidence. So our thoughts were to arrest him, place him in custody, get our search warrant, knowing that we've protected our evidence now. We, uh, we seize the scene, secure the scene to make sure nobody can tamper with anything, and uh, put our search warrant together. On Sunday, April 28th, three days after the alleged accident, Detective Sergeant Tom McDonald arrests Winston Malcolm for the first degree murder of Jan Marshall. Mr. Malcolm's demeanor at the time was fairly quiet. Uh, he was passive and uh, showed little emotion. On Monday, the pathologist begins the autopsy of the victim. Forensic identification officer Scott McLeod is present. The autopsy was held in Toronto at the Foreigners Building. My job would be to record the autopsy, so I would take still photographs at that time and collect any evidence that was uh, uh, recovered from her, including her all her clothing. Her body was in, in good condition. Um, there, there was no decomposition. Uh, the water was like um, being in the bathtub too long. Um, hands were a little um, wrinkled, but uh, she was in good condition. There was obvious signs of trauma and bruising to the neck area, which caused some bruising to the trachea and the hyoid area. She had been manually strangled, which caused these, the bruising and the particular hemorrhaging. Uh, strangled to the point that uh, she was rendered unconscious, but not deceased. And then uh, the lake finished the job. The pathologist, Dr. Sepp, um, believe the death was due to drowning. Uh, she was not dead when she entered the water. And that uh, she had suffered particular hemorrhaging to uh, both eyelids and eyes. The autopsy reveals that Jan's death is due to more than just a canoeing accident. Did Winston accidentally strangle Jan during a fight? Did he panic when he thought he had killed her and threw her into the lake to hide her body? 
Or did he plan all along to render her unconscious and dump her body in Lake Simcoe to make it look like an accidental drowning? In addition to the, uh, the standard uh, post-mortem, uh, there was a diatom test that was performed by the coroner to indicate uh, in which body of water Jan had uh, died. The results conclude that Jan did indeed drown in Lake Simcoe. Deep bruising found on her left shoulder blade is consistent with injuries that could have been made by dragging the body by the arms. The investigators want to determine how long the victim was unconscious before she took her last breath beneath the surface of Lake Simcoe. To determine when the assault occurred, the coroner orders a brain scan. If she'd been unconscious for an extended period of time, usually, uh, you know, six, eight, nine hours, at least somewhere in the, that range, uh, the, that may be shown in the, those brain slides, which would then give us an indication on how long maybe before her body was deposited, because uh, we knew for five hours that she was in that canoe. And probably unconscious. So how long before 11 a.m. Uh, had the altercation taken place where she was rendered unconscious? Uh, so that would help us narrow down the time of uh, the event and help us focus on gathering evidence there. So he did take slides of the brain, and they were sent away, but they came back inconclusive. The brain scan was inconclusive but the results from the post-mortem provide police with even more evidence to support their theory and charges. Back in uh, the mid-90s, and the law was a lot different back then. Um, how, however, um, a warrant to arrest, a police officer can arrest a person on reasonable probable grounds that they've committed an indictable offense, which we certainly had at that point in time. Uh, grounds for search are, are an awful lot more onerous in that we we have to be able to identify what crime has taken place, uh, where it may have taken place, what evidence we hope to find in the place we want to search, and we have to be specific. Police then proceed to search the home of Jan and Winston. My focus is first on recording the scene without um, disrupting anything. Uh, second, I'm then looking for anything that may be on the warrant. Uh, while I'm doing my photography or my videography. Um, that's pretty well where my focus is the whole time I'm there. I don't tend to think of how people live or why they, why items may be in the house or not. Um, my focus is on whether it may be relevant to the investigation. There are times when you may find something on the premise that's not listed on the warrant. Uh, if it's relevant to your case, you can seize it. Uh, it just has to be brought before a justice after the search warrant has been completed and the seizure has to be justified. If the justice is satisfied with that, then you've legally obtained that item. One such object is an empty bottle of tranquilizers. Is this a relevant factor in the investigation? Once filming and photographing are complete, the forensic identification technician draws a map of the home. In this case, we did. There was a two-story uh, brick and aluminum home, and we did a scale diagram of the main, well, all three floors, the main floor, the bedroom floor, and the basement. Based on evidence found at the crime scene, Scott McLeod makes a special effort to look for corroborating evidence. She was found with a section of uh, yellow nylon rope um, loosely attached to her. So we would be interested to know whether there's any yellow nylon rope somewhere on the house premises. Very close by to her on the bottom of the lake was a, a patio stone. Near the rear of the house. The very last position where a patio stone should have been, uh, there was a stone missing.
So we made a plaster cast of that so that we could show definitively that that patio stone was taken from that spot outside Mr. Mr. Malcolm's home. There was a car. Uh, it was fairly close to the steps leading into the house. After it was photographed, uh, we took uh, tapings from within the car. And what a taping is, is, is merely taking normal scotch tape, wrapping it around your hand, and, and, and touching the back of, for instance, the back of the car seat. And then we'll do several of those from within the car. Uh, we also took tapings from the trunk of the car. Um, once that was done, we actually took the trunk liner as a piece of evidence. Both of them shared that vehicle, so to find a, a hair uh, in the trunk would not have been overly significant. Uh, finding a, a broken hair or a hair with a root uh, may have been a little more significant. Uh, a little more weight could have been put on it as to um, how the hair would have removed from, from her head. McLeod hopes to find proof that Winston moved Jan's bruised and unconscious body to the lake in the trunk of the car. Reports from the Center of Forensic Sciences showed that um, there were microscopically similar fibers on her clothing as were found in the trunk liner. Um, the working theory was that that's how she was transported to the lake, and that's why we, we took the trunk liner to see that whether there was hair and fibers that would match her clothing and vice versa. Ten days later, Winston's red canoe is recovered. Hopefully, it will reveal more clues about the tragic circumstances of Jan Marsh's death. The body of Jan Marshall is found in Lake Simcoe, Ontario. Her husband, Winston Malcolm, claims his wife capsized the canoe, throwing them both into the frigid water. Witness statements contradict Winston's story. After the discovery of important evidence, they arrest him for the murder of his wife. The canoe, which had drifted away, has just been found. The canoe was uh, red in color, and it was located uh, in Big Bay Point approximately four or five miles from the location. So we had put out uh, alerts through the media uh, indicating that we were looking for this canoe, and a, uh, a cottager had actually found it. I ended up going to the Innisfil Police Service uh, and, and took general photographs of the recovered canoe. Uh, I did examine the inside to see whether there'd be any uh, major scratches or, or something that couldn't be explained um, through normal use and I didn't find anything. The investigation draws to a close, except for one final search, which proves to be revealing. We did a search warrant on the hospital and seized the medical records, and it was located uh, there that he had, uh, had an elevated, highly elevated uh, level of a certain uh, prescription drug in his, in his system, which um, was way beyond therapeutic range. In a statement made to his lawyer, Winston said he had ingested 30 tablets of clonazepam in an attempt to take his own life. Investigators try to put together the series of events that took place April 25th, 1996. We believe that he thought he'd killed her. Uh, there was indications that uh, after the, the act, the violent act in the house, that he took a uh, large number of uh, prescription pills in an attempt to take his own life. That obviously didn't work. And uh, then he decided that he had to uh, find something to do with the body. And he came up with the canoe and disposing the body in the lake. And uh, I think his story was going to be that she had planning to leave. She had indeed left, and he hasn't seen or heard of her. And when he capsized, I think the, the plan went awry. When he first put in, the witness tell us uh, the ice flow was 30 to 40 feet offshore. And by 4 p.m., it was uh, close to 300 yards offshore. So uh, we theorized that he was waiting for water to be deep enough that he could dispose of the body safely. Uh, our theory was that she was in the sleeping bag. And that helped him hide the body from sight. And that the patio stone and, and rope were, were tied to her in the sleeping bag 
and that when he threw her overboard, her body came out of the sleeping bag, and the sleeping bag remained on the surface, and her body uh, sunk to the bottom with the stone. Those nylon ropes aren't really good at holding a knot, and uh, so we theorized that the patio stone, probably the, the knot came undone and the, the cord came off the patio stone and just hung there in her bell hoop. Investigators have everything they need to prepare for trial. Well, the next stage in the investigation, of course, is the, the coordination of all the, uh, all the statements and, and evidence that you have acquired and getting the accused properly before the courts. A preliminary hearing was uh, scheduled uh, shortly thereafter. It lasted approximately three weeks. We provide the Crown with uh, our investigation, and uh, we went through with them. We explained uh, the evidence we had, the key witnesses. We gave them a copy of our entire investigative brief, and it's, it's, it's kind of a way for the defense also to uh, to see just what the evidence is. Of course, we make full disclosure, but they also get to see just how good the, uh, the witnesses are. And for the Crown to also choose and, and make sure that the witnesses and the evidence are, are solid. Uh, but it's, it's mostly for the judge to determine that, yes, this is the right charge, they have the evidence to support it, and this, this trial is worthy to go on to a full trial. We thought we had a good case for first. Um, but first is very difficult to prove, obviously, in, uh, in situations like this. And, but uh, he would have had to explain, I, I believe personally, that he would have had to have taken the stand to explain the, uh, the contradictory statements he made to witnesses and the police. So I think that would have been a tough one for him to get over. Winston pleads guilty to second degree murder. His lawyer knows the prosecution cannot prove premeditation, which is essential for a first degree murder charge. We believed that uh, at that time, with the information that we had, that it was planned and, uh, and deliberate. Um, however, we, we know that uh, unfortunate uh, domestic situations sometimes can get out of hand. Ms. Marshall had a uh, bruising on the forehead. We believe she was hit with something. And the forehead, there was some blunt uh, trauma to the forehead, the manual strangulation. There was other bruising to her elbows. And so there were signs of a struggle, there were signs of violence. Uh, not unlike uh, you know, a, a domestic situation or a physical altercation. On April 10th, 1997, Winston Malcolm is convicted of the second degree murder of Jan Marshall. He receives a 25 year sentence and is eligible for parole after having served a minimum of 10 years in a penitentiary. The investigating team is satisfied with the sentence. Uh, the role that water played in, in this investigation was uh, unfortunately a means of disposing of, of a body. Um, ultimately the, uh, the cause of death for Jan was drowning. Uh, so it played a, a very big part in her, in her demise. It struck me in that uh, um, the water killed Jan, yet that wasn't the intent of uh, Winston. His intent was to use the water, as it so often is, to uh, hide a crime or to cover a crime. And uh, it actually helped him commit the crime. He thought he'd killed her, and he hadn't. And uh, so the water did the job for him. We may never know for sure if Winston Malcolm intended to kill Jan Marshall. But one thing is certain. The waters of Lake Simcoe ultimately served as the perfect murder weapon. Source of life and cause of death. Water can wash away clues, dilute evidence, and conceal corpses. For investigators, water can be a cunning opponent. For criminals, 
most accommodating ally. For the perfect crime, just add water. In the Pacific Northwest, along the southern coast of British Columbia, lies the picturesque Strait of Georgia. This will be the stage for the gruesome discoveries of seven disarticulated human feet. All of these feet, encased in running shoes, will be given over to the authorities over a period of two years. This case will baffle the authorities and scientists for years to come and will capture the interest of the international press. On August 20th, 2007, a young girl and her family are visiting British Columbia. On the beach of Jedediah Island, a girl notices several running shoes. She picks one up. Pulling on the sock that is still inside, she is surprised to see that it contains a human foot. She calls out to her family who immediately alert the police. In these coastal regions, civil protection is provided by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, who treat these cases as any other suspicious matter. Annie Linto is the RCMP spokesperson. Obviously, we arrive on the scene. We use the laboratory for forensic identification. They search the scene and write a report. They take photographs and video of the scene. Then our investigators also search along the shore and talk to witnesses, etc. But the police do not find another foot or the body of a victim who could help them understand how the foot has wound up there. Less than a week later, about 50 kilometers south on Gabriola Island, a couple is on a hike along the ocean. Suddenly, they notice a running shoe with the laces still tied. They turn it up and see a bone sticking out of the shoe. The couple immediately called the police. At a press conference, the RCMP report what little they know at the time. There were two right feet found, and both are in men's size 12 running shoes. According to the investigators, the probability of finding two feet of the same size is very low. The police invite the public to contact them if they have any information concerning the case. The story spreads quickly through the media and the imagination of the public explodes. Questions arise. Who did the feet belong to? Why did they end up on these islands? How did they become separated from the rest of the body? Are they linked to a single event? A plane crash, or a boating accident, perhaps? Or worse, could they be victims of a crime whose bodies have been cut up and thrown in the water? We received about a dozen calls, but they were mostly theories about what they thought might have happened. People seem to have a morbid fascination as to the origin of these feet. The first thing we must do is to identify the victim. It's the first step. Then the identification will show us a bit more whether or not we must pursue a criminal investigation. The RCMP transfer the two right feet to the BC coroner's office. The office is responsible for a completely different aspect of this investigation and tries by various scientific means to extract the maximum amount of information from these mysterious feet. The police departments are involved in a, a fault-finding process. They're looking for uh, criminal activity. They're investigating the potential of a crime, whereas the coroner's service are involved in a fact-finding investigation. So we're responsible not only for the identification of the, of the decedent, but also when they died, where they died, how they died, and by what means. We classify that death as either natural, um, uh, suicide, accident, homicide, or undetermined. If you've only got a foot, why is it that you only have a foot? And the pathologist can sometimes help with that by determining whether there's any evidence of trauma, if there's any uh, mechanical removal of that foot from the rest of the body. 
When a foot is found in a shoe on the beach, you know, there's not a lot that we know about it immediately. And we certain that's what the investigation is all about. And from there on, we'd use a number of different experts. An anthropologist might be really valuable. Um, there might, you know, there may be bugs within the sock. You know, so if there's insects, perhaps an entomologist might be useful to help us. How quickly a body decomposes depends on where it is and the types of organisms that attack it. The coroner enlists the services of Dr. Gail Anderson, who researches human decomposition. I've been working in forensic entomology now for over 20 years, and whenever I speak to police officers, uh, I've been able to show the kind of research I do and how it works in a, an actual homicide investigation. But they would always ask, yes, but what happens when a body's in the water? And it became very frustrating not to be able to answer that question. So we started looking at uh, carcasses, animal carcasses, first of all in fresh water, and then now more recently in the marine environment. We've always used pig carcasses in forensic entomology. They're considered to be a very good mimic for human decomposition. Obviously, it's much more difficult to, to use human bodies. So pig carcasses make a good replication for humans. Pigs are roughly the same size as the adult human torso. So this is where most of the decomposition is taking place in a human being, with the face and the head and, and the gut region. And so a pig, if we get the right size pig, roughly mimics that. My main interest in looking at bodies in water is to look at the animals that uh, scavenge or feed on the body. As a forensic entomologist on land, I look at the insects that colonize a body over time and use that to estimate how long that person's been dead. So in the water, I'm trying to do the same sort of thing, only there I'm not looking really at insects, I'm looking at their family members, they're the same sort of group, we're looking at the arthropods. So crabs, shrimp, things like that. We do know of situations where bodies, we know they only went into the water a few days before and they're almost skeletonized when we find them. Uh, that's one of the problems of the ocean. When you look at research on land, you can say, well, research conducted in this area is going to be very similar to research conducted in this area because geographically they're very similar, they've got the same kind of plants, meteorological conditions and things. But in the ocean, the, the situation changes within a few meters. In my shallow experiments, I found that carcasses that rotted on rock were very different from those that rotted on sand, even a few meters apart. The coroner's office also enlists the services of a DNA expert to gain insight on this strange case. Well, once the autopsy is complete, that's when we look at extracting a DNA sample. That sample would be submitted to a lab, and they may have to try a number of times to actually generate a profile. Um, just because we have a sample doesn't mean we're going to get DNA. Um, there's a big challenge with developing DNA profiles from degraded remains. Investigators call on the Department of Forensic Science at the BC Institute of Technology. Moisture can be detrimental to DNA because it does facilitate the growth of microbes, bacteria, and fungus. So it just allows those things to infiltrate a sample and excrete these enzymes called nucleases, which is what degrades the DNA and makes it unusable. But as you decompose, that uh, soft tissue will break down. And along that, along with that, would be the, the breakdown of the DNA. So um, what you want to do is go after the hard tissues in a, in a difficult case, because the hard tissue lasts longer and therefore protects the DNA inside the hard tissue. Retesting is something we have to do if we're not successful the first time around. So sometimes we'll go back and get a larger sampling of the bone, because DNA doesn't uh, degrade consistently throughout the body. Some bones may have nothing. Other bones may still have a trace of DNA. While specialists examine the feet for clues to their origins, the RCMP begin looking at events that could have caused the death of the victims. They start with all accidents over the past years that occurred in or around the water on the south coast of British Columbia. But we also looked at all incidents, like boats that may have sunk or maybe planes that crashed. One incident in particular is that in 2005, there was a plane crash at Quadra Island. And it is assumed that the passengers were killed and were never found. In 2005, five men board a float plane for what should be a routine trip to a logging camp up the BC coast. They take off from Camel River in the morning mist and are never heard from again.
For two days, volunteers and authorities search by boat and helicopter, but find nothing. On the third day, the body of only one of the passengers washes up on Quadra Island. Five months later, the plane is recovered from 240 meters underwater. Sadly, the pilot and the three other passengers are not on board. Two years after the plane crash, the families of the missing men hear about the feet washing ashore only 100 kilometers away. Their hopes are sparked and they eagerly give DNA samples to the RCMP and anxiously await the results. They'll be compared with the profiles from the found remains. Well, we know that in your DNA profile, we have to see a match to your mom and dad. Now, if we use your brother or sister, statistically, you're more likely to share components, but you don't have to. So it makes it a lot more difficult to use siblings, particularly if you've only got one sibling. It can get a little bit better if you have multiple siblings, because you can put all the information together. Will the test results show a connection between the feet found on Jedediah and Gabriola Islands and the victims of the crash? In August 2007, in British Columbia's Strait of Georgia, tourists make two separate discoveries of running shoes containing human right feet. Only 50 kilometers separate the two islands where the gruesome discoveries are made. The RCMP and the coroner's office collaborate. They rely on many experts to help them explain the discoveries. On February 8, 2008, two foresters find another right foot buried in a running shoe. This shocking discovery is on Valdez Island, about 10 kilometers from Gabriola Island, where the second foot was found. That makes three men's right feet in less than six months. After the discovery of the second foot, we were a little curious. Maybe it was a coincidence. But after the third, we were very curious. It is a bit strange. So the police started an investigation that was a little bit more integrated. But it's not unusual to find, find incomplete body parts. I mean, that is not something that, you know, that, that would shock us. Many. We, we found with the unit specifically that I manage, we have up to 60% of our cases that are incomplete. So finding incomplete bodies is not unusual. It's just that these feet and shoes were found in a short span of time. The public is anxious to know the identity of the remains. Speculations continue to rise. Do the feet belong to the victims of the Quadra Island plane crash? or do they belong to victims of a completely different accident? The coroner has determined that there is no evidence of trauma or mechanical removal of the feet from the rest of the body. So how did the feet become disembodied? It's a very natural uh, situation for the body to disarticulate as it breaks down. First of all, uh, through the scavenging of the tissue that holds you together, then eventually by breaking up the cartilage, eating the cartilage, and, and completely disarticulating the body. If any of those body parts are attached to something that's a natural flotation device, like for instance a running shoe, uh, then it would be quite natural for it to rise to the surface, just like your bloated body would, and then potentially with the tides and currents be washed ashore. In spite of these facts, the investigators need to know when the victims died and were put in the water. But water can influence decomposition of a body in many ways. Well, water temperature certainly affects the, the decomposition of the body in water, as it does on land. And in general, the water temperature is a lot cooler, and certainly it is here in the, the Vancouver region. Our temperatures are consistently around about 9 degrees Celsius, so that's quite cool. So that can slow down decomposition because it slows down the bacterial action. The running shoes play an intriguing role in the discovery of the feet. The rubber soles of the runners act as floats to keep the feet adrift and protects them from scavenging birds and the UV rays of the sun. 
once the, the joint is disarticulated, then the, the foot is now free to perhaps float to the surface. And in particular, if the foot is in a light running shoe, we've all seen the, the trend over the last decade of shoes getting lighter and lighter, in particular running shoes, that these, the, the feet would be protected uh, and possibly float to the surface. If the density of the shoe is, is light enough, it'll stay at the surface forever. Because the feet are in an advanced state of decomposition, it's likely they spent a long time in water. Given that state of decomposition and the probable contamination of the feet, it may not be possible to obtain complete DNA samples. As the technology becomes more and more sensitive, it becomes easier and easier to contaminate that sample. So anybody who comes into contact with that bone, for example, may contaminate it with their own sample just by touching it, breathing on it, sneezing on it. So it's contamination control is a key concern and one of the reasons why it takes long to get uh, DNA from these, uh, these samples. Well, there's different ways to clean samples. You can sand it, you can rinse it with uh, water and ethanol, and we actually expose all of the samples before we pulverize them to really intense UV light. Bleach is actually a, a cheap and effective way to decontaminate uh, your evidence. So you can get rid of the DNA that you don't want. Being able to obtain DNA samples remains the foundation of the investigation. Once the victim is identified, we'll be able to see their history. That is, whether the person was out fishing, were they out on a boat? They might have fallen into the water, or is it that the person might be involved in organized crime, in a gang, etc.? It is the mandate of the coroner's office to determine if a death occurred due to natural causes, suicide, or homicide. In a case such as the mysterious feat, that represents a big challenge. It's not just relying on what the pathologist can advise, but also what the scene's telling you, what the history has indicated. We know of many accidents. You know, there are plane crashes, there are, there are boating incidents. We know of mis many missing people that we prioritize. Um, because there is always a potential that that person may have been brought by various currents and other ways to that particular point where, they were, where the feet were recovered. The high suicide rate is an important consideration in solving this mystery. Vancouver is located along the Fraser River and has a number of very high bridges that link the north and south shores. Over the decades, many people have chosen to end their lives by jumping to their death from these bridges. Another question is whether or not the feet could be linked to the cases of missing men in Metro Vancouver. Many of these men disappeared in or close to water. One of these missing men is John Kaler. His truck was found near Stave Lake, which flows into the Fraser River. The truck was running with the door open the radio and the windshield wipers were on, and his cell phone was on the seat. In the course of our investigation, we reviewed all of the missing persons files in the province. Then they were prioritized. And then these files were given to investigators to try to see if we could find additional clues. but the mystery of the disembodied feet remains intact. Investigators compare the evidence they have gathered to the database of missing persons looking for leads. But this is not as easy as it sounds. I can uh, give you a, a sense of how difficult this, uh, this problem is when a foot washes up on shore. Um, you have to understand that there are approximately 200 sets of unidentified remains that the, that the BC Coroner Service has. We don't know who they are and there's approximately 2,000 missing people reported in the province of BC alone. So it's a matter of matching up these 200 unidentifieds to 2,000 missing persons. 
There isn't DNA done on all of these samples yet. So when you throw a, a single bone or a single found foot into this mix, uh, it's a huge problem to solve. The DNA comparisons alone could add months, even years, to the investigators' quest for the facts. But will their efforts be rewarded with a match? Within six months, three disembodied men's right feet are found inside running shoes. They were found on three separate islands in the Strait of Georgia, British Columbia. Theories are multiplying. Were these victims of suicide, boating or marine accidents, or maybe the growing number of gang-related murders? Some people believe the feet may belong to victims of a plane crash near Quadra Island two years earlier. Since then, the wrecked plane has been recovered. There were no passengers on board. The seatbelts were not attached, suggesting that the victims escaped before the crash. The family's only hopes lie in the results from their DNA comparisons. Now that the bones from the feet have been cleaned, they can begin to extract samples used to create genetic profiles. The process of getting DNA is actually, as, as good as the technology is today, is still a fairly labor-intensive process to get DNA from something like a bone sample. They have to carefully pulverize the sample right down to almost the consistency of flour to maximize the access to the remnants of DNA that were trapped all throughout that sample. The way we do it is to use what's called a cryogenic grinder. So we put it inside a sealed, sterile chamber with a metal impactor and that goes inside a special instrument that's immersed in liquid nitrogen. And then that steel impactor goes back and forth and pulverizes that sample at very low temperatures. So we take that sample and we do a quantification on it to see if there's human DNA there. And if there is, then we go to the third step and that's amplification. Use a, using a technique called polymerase chain reaction that allows you to amplify the regions of interest for identification. We call that an electropherogram but it's just easier to say it's a DNA profile. It looks like, on a piece of paper, uh, a series of colored peaks. And those colored peaks, as I mentioned before, will, can be uh, transposed into a series of unique numbers. Besides the human remains, the only other pieces of evidence are the runners. What can investigators discover from the shoes? So we made inquiries with the manufacturers of the shoes to find out where the shoes were made, as well as where and when they were distributed, in an attempt to build a time frame of when the victims might have disappeared. There's a lot that shoes can't tell you. There's a production date for a shoe, for instance. So that provides you with sort of some sort of temporal parameters to look at. So you can start looking at missing people within a certain range of time. So there's a lot the shoes can provide. There's si shoe sizes, there's male and female shoes. Not that that's a definitive way to make an exclusion in terms of sex, but there is a lot of information on the shoe that can, that can certainly assist you with enhancing the profile of the individual who you believe to be deceased. Investigators gave the ID numbers found inside the shoes to the manufacturers, who told them where the shoes were made and distributed. Two of the runners were sold in North America, while the third one was sold in India. This information gives investigators a way to refine their search. The long process of creating genetic profiles for the three feet is complete but that is only the first step in the identification process. Once you get a DNA profile from that, all that tells you is the sex of the individual. Unless you have something to compare it to, it's really of no use. So the next, the next half of the investigation is to find something to compare to. They begin the difficult task of reviewing hundreds of files of missing persons using the criteria they have gathered, such as sex, dates of production for the runners, location, and date of when they were last seen alive. From those results, a list of people to whom the feed could belong to is produced. 
relatives of the people on that list can then be contacted for samples of DNA to compare to the profiles made from the remains. So that comparison could be running it, running it against a database of known samples. It could be the investigator going out and speaking to the family and getting samples from the family to compare against. Or it could be going to the missing person's apartment and getting their toothbrush or razor to use as a, a source of known DNA for comparison. We have databases now that help us screen large numbers of profiles, but ultimately it's going to come down to an expert like myself that has to look at these two profiles from the phone and from some other source and may do a statistical calculation and come up with an expert opinion on whether or not this is the deceased person you think it is. While Dean Hildebrand compares results to the DNA database, the case of the unknown feet gets bigger. May 22nd, 2008, a man is walking his dog on Kirkland Island near the Vancouver airport. Kirkland is a small, uninhabited island in the Fraser River Delta. It is about 40 kilometers from Valdez Island, where the third foot was discovered three months earlier. A running shoe with a sock inside attracts the attention of his dog. The man looks inside the sock and discovers a human foot. This represents the fourth right foot in nine months. However, it's the first female foot. Is the fact that they are all right feet a coincidence? Speculations run high. Outrageous and diverse theories erupt. Is it the work of a serial killer whose calling card is right feet? Do these feet belong to victims of drownings in the Pacific Ocean? Could they belong to the victims of the Quadra plane crash? Maybe they belong to some of the thousands of missing persons in British Columbia. Will the genetic comparisons provide an answer to these questions? An ever-growing number of disembodied feet have been found in the Strait of Georgia, British Columbia. The discoveries stun the public and baffle authorities. The families of the victims of a plane crash, as well as those of dozens of missing men, anxiously await the results of the genetic comparisons with the feet. If the female victim has lived in British Columbia for a while, the chances of identification are better than for male victims because of the work done by the BC Cancer Agency. The closest thing to a repository we have for potential known samples of DNA would be the BC Cancer Agency who keeps pap smears on file for obviously half of our population that has pap smears done. Um, and we've actually used pap smears to identify skeletonized remains uh, in, in the past. And a lot of investigators, well, it's getting better now, they know that. But uh, those, those, those slides can be kept for many, many years, and they're known sources, they're medical samples from half our population. But none of the pap tests in the bank lead to an identification of a female foot. June 16, 2008, a couple is out for a walk on Westham Island in Delta, British Columbia. Floating on the water along the shore, they discover the fifth foot in less than a year. The island lies less than one kilometer from Kirkland Island, where the fourth discovery took place. So one might expect the feet to match. This foot belongs to a man, just like the other three feet, but it is the first left foot. There's something very strange about either right feet or, or the source. Um, in some sense, it was a bit of a, a relief when a left foot showed up as well. From a scientific perspective at the moment, I don't think we would speculate that right feet have any special characteristic over left feet. Um, it's just the, the, the way things worked out. The investigation reveals that one of the shoes was sold in India. This raises the questions, where did these feet come from and how did they get into the Strait of Georgia? The investigators turned to the oceanographic community to help unravel the mystery. Dr. Richard Dewey has his own theory. We do not believe they've come from the open ocean and ended up washing up on our shores. The, the oceanographic dynamics do not support that hypothesis. So in that sense, we can constrain the investigation 
to really being a local investigation. Georgia Strait is quite separated, and the flow at the surface, where these feet would have done most of their traveling, is outwards, out to the Pacific Ocean. So it's unlikely uh, we're looking at a remote source. They're probably local. But knowing that the feet are from this region does not do much to help the investigation. The Fraser River is 1,375 kilometers long, and the Strait of Georgia has an area of 6,800 square kilometers. That's more than 100 times the area of the island of Manhattan, an enormous area to investigate. So there's a lot of circulation patterns that are going on at the same time, and the Strait of Georgia is a very large basin, and it's influenced by primarily tidal motion. The outflow of the Fraser River into the Strait of Georgia is enormous and has a significant effect on the surface current. And all that fresh water flows into the Strait of Georgia and influences the circulation. So the Fraser River plume accentuates the circulation that would go around the inlet or around the basin and cause things to perhaps circulate for weeks or months and spread things out. With the investigation covering such an extensive territory, determining the exact location of these feet is almost impossible. The number of possible scenarios is so high that it's difficult to narrow down the research. Um, it may seem surprising that these feet are found at very different beaches, but in reality, if you, if you threw in a, a bunch of wood chips, the same thing would happen. You'd get wood chips eventually showing up on all the shores. The results are finally in. Unfortunately, the DNA from the feet does not match any of the samples given by the families of the plane crash victims or the families of the missing men in British Columbia. The investigation has made some progress, but it's not exactly what everyone expected. They have found that the third foot and the fifth foot belong to the same man. The curious thing about these feet is the fact that they were washing up, not all together, um, but spread out around the entire Strait of Georgia uh, geographically and spread out over a long period of time. Um, it turns out the two of the feet from the same body washed up on different shores months apart. The feet may come up weeks apart or they may come up very close together. Um, if they come up uh, weeks apart, they will enter different sort of circulations. As they come up, they may encounter different wind conditions, for example, dip come up at different times of the season. But even if they came up together relatively close to the same time, the circulation patterns are complex enough that things would get separated over time scales of days to weeks. And the wind eventually blows things up onto the shore, the wave action and wind action. So eventually flotsam that floats on the surface will eventually end up on the shore. And so the, it's perhaps not too surprising that uh, even feet from different bodies, but certainly it's the same body, ended up on opposite shores, separated by several months. Another question that puzzles investigators is, what happened to the bodies of the four victims? Gail Anderson studies decomposition using the world's most advanced ocean research technology, the Venus Ocean Observatory. When you're doing my kind of research in the ocean, uh, accessibility is the main problem. Obviously, you need to have cameras down there, you need divers, you need boats. And this becomes very limiting financially, but also safety-wise. I can't put carcasses at very great depths if I'm using human beings to go down. And obviously, there's a limited amount of time that people can spend down there and how often they can go down. Venus eliminates all of those problems by having a remote camera on the bottom of the ocean that I can control from a laptop anywhere in the world. Richard Dewey is the Associate Director of Research for the Venus Project at the University of Victoria. Basically, the infrastructure that uh, in, makes up the observatory is a, a shore station which provides power and communications to the subsea components, what we call a node. And the node is an underwater hub, if you like. It's where we plug I instruments in, they get power, and they get Ethernet connection back to the shore station. So the, the marine cable and the node provide us with a, the, the permanent infrastructure sitting on the bottom. And then we lower down instrument packages, plug them into the node, and they're live on the internet and back here to the university where we log the data. Our primary uh, set of researchers are ocean scientists and uh, oceanographers, marine geologists, uh, people that it would typically be associated with marine research. 
but by uh, once we installed the observatory and uh, the, the word got out there that we had this facility feeding uh, data streams over the web, we were contacted by a variety of scientists that are outside the marine science environment. We have uh, Gail Anderson with forensics. We have a variety of computing science and engineering uh, scientists that have contacted us. They're interested in advanced systems or they're interested in complex data. Gail Anderson experiments using pig carcasses. They're an ideal replica for humans because they are omnivores, relatively hairless, and roughly the same size as the adult human torso. In my first carcass with Venus at 100 meters, uh, a shark took out a large chunk of flesh on the second day. And that open area became a major site of almost all the activity. All the crabs, the shrimp, everything came to that area. In the second carcass, uh, we didn't get a shark attack until about two weeks into the decomposition. And there, all the activity was centered around the gut region, where decomposition was taking place with the bacterial action. And the large crabs were able to rip open that gut area, and the smaller animals were able to get in. A third pig carcass has been placed at a much lower depth. In the third carcass, it was a lot lower oxygen levels, so a lot of the larger animals, like crabs, couldn't get to the bodies. There, there was almost no damage to the pig for several months until the oxygen increased. The carcasses were pretty much scavenged of any uh, tissue by about 21, 23 days after I placed them at 100 meters. Uh, a lot longer time, actually, at the shallower depths. But uh, to actually see the bones completely separated and, and no cartilage left, it's about 40 to 43 days under these circumstances. Regardless of the depth the victim sank to, it's probable that there was an onslaught of living organisms attacking the body. It's likely that the running shoes protected the feet and floated them to the surface. On June 18th, 2008, another foot in a running shoe is found on Tai Spit, located near Quadra Island. The shoe is given to the coroner's office, who quickly determines that the discovery is a fake. An examination by a pathologist establishes that jokers have stuffed the shoe with an animal paw, much to the despair of the families of the plane crash victims. The coroner now has five feet belonging to four unidentified victims. Do these people have something in common? Are they victims of the same accident or the prey of a sinister murderer? In a period of 10 months, five human feet have been discovered encased in running shoes. They have been found on the shores of the Fraser River and islands of the Strait of Georgia in British Columbia. For the sixth time, the families of the missing persons and plane crash victims have had their hopes shattered. What appeared to be a sixth foot turned out to be a cruel hoax. You know, when you, when you stage a hoax like that and you take all the investigative resources and time to attend a scene, to process a case, that time could have been committed to making an identification on another case, uh, bringing, bringing closure to this family. It's, it's really devastating to the family because as soon as they hear of, of another human remains case found, they're all waiting for, you know, they're waiting for that call, they're expecting the worst. It puts families under tremendous amount of pressure. Authorities are still baffled. Investigators have not been able to put an identity to any of the human remains, and they have not found any evidence to link these remains to a crime. On July 10th, 2008, about a year after the discovery of the first foot, the authorities hold another press conference. They present the new information they have, pictures of the running shoes, information on when and where the shoes were made and where they were distributed. So it's really important for us to utilize the media as, a, as an investigative tool to get very um, important pieces of information some of those enhanced detailed uh, characteristics um, out into the community so that hopefully someone recognizes them and can, can associate that with somebody who's missing from their community, from their family. The investigators also want to take the opportunity to educate the public. They ask Dean Hildebrand to attend the conference. He talks about the limitations of the standardized test used for forensic DNA analysis called STR, or short tandem repeats. 
There's a lot of information in our DNA, obviously. I mean, the, our DNA will dictate what race we are. It will dictate our skin tones, our eye colors, hair colors. So that information is there. However, the DNA that we target for forensics, these STRs, all they do is tell you the sex. They don't, they're not good indicators of race. They don't tell you eye color, hair color, stature, anything like that. There is work being done in this field to try and uh, uh, tease out that information about uh, perhaps the racial uh, origins of, of uh, a sample, a DNA sample, a set of remains. There's also common questions from police when they have a, a blood stain at a crime scene, for example. What can you tell me about the offender? We don't know anything about the person who left this. Um, obviously, we can tell the male or female, but can you tell me what skin color, what eye color, what hair color? That information is theoretically there, but it's not routine yet, getting access to that information. The press conference generates dozens of leads. One family recognizes the first shoe and wonders if it belongs to one of their missing family members. Full of hope, they call the authorities and offer information. The investigators achieve their first real breakthrough. They gave us a DNA sample and the resulting profile has allowed us to identify the first foot as belonging to a person who was missing from the metro area of Vancouver. The information they told us was that the person was emotionally unstable. We have made one identification, which has been very important, obviously, to the family. And also important because we can get a sense of the circumstances and the uh, issues surrounding that death. On October 21st, 2008, another discovery is made by a kayaker. But this time, it's not a shoe. It's the body of John Kaler, floating in Stave Lake nearly one year after he went missing. His feet are intact. Then, on November 11th, 2008, while out for a walk near Finn Slough, along the Fraser River, a couple finds a blue and white running shoe. It contains a size 7 left foot belonging to a woman. The coroner's office matches the sixth foot to the fourth foot found six months earlier on Kirkland Island, located directly across the Fraser River. This discovery brings the case to six feet belonging to four people. We get about 7,500 to 7,700 cases reported to the coroner service every year. Of that, we probably end up at the end of the year with maybe five to 10 at the most, um, where we're still struggling to make an identification. If we look at all of our cases that date back as far as the 60s, we only have 200 unidentified human remains cases. So, so long as those human remains remain unidentified, we have to continue investigating. And, you know, I think the families should feel confident that we're doing everything that we can. We've used the type of tech, all the latest types of technology that we can to enhance the profiles. And hopefully, all of this effort will come, you know, will be rewarded with an identification. On October 27th, 2009, Two men walking along the Fraser River, a few kilometers upstream from the last three discoveries, find the seventh foot to wash ashore in British Columbia in two years. The investigation of the disembodied feet continues. These cases are not closed, as long as the victims have not been identified. So they could stay open forever. But one thing is certain is that before these incidents, I think that often people found or saw shoes along the beaches, and most people kept walking. Now, I think that, and this includes myself, I think if now we walk along a beach, along a shoreline, and you see a shoe, you'll probably stop and then look inside. The waters of the Fraser River and the Strait of Georgia still hold their secrets. Maybe one day, another clue will wash ashore and reveal the identities of the disembodied feet of British Columbia.